right, hello and welcome to episode 42 of The Crackdown. This will be one of the last ones of the year, probably the last three-man uh, episode of the year. And today we have the upside-down god himself, God Gilius, here to discuss uh, pretty much everything uh, with us starting early on in his career. We're going to jump on a bunch of different topics. Uh, I actually used to have have some Twitter beef with Gilius back in the day. You know, we squashed that in like season eight, season nine. And, you know. Did he get you, did he get you with anything good? Did he have any good flame for you? Um, what, did, what, did, what did he say to me? So I think that. <laughs> I'm going to get ready. It was just something about you being from NA. I bet that was the no, angle, no, no, was it? No, no. I, I remember no. exactly what the, the, the tweet was. It was something like, because when I retired, I was like. I was like, yeah, man, I've just decided to retire because streaming is a better option. He's like, you think you right. retired because streaming is a better option and not because you were shit? And I was like, all right, man, like, okay. who the fuck are you? You're like, at that point, he hadn't he hadn't really, like, established himself. might have been, like, season six, season seven. But, you know, like, we, we talked and I was like, yeah, man, that's, I'm just, like, fucking joking around on Twitter. It's just how I am. So I, I've noticed that, that that with you, Gilius, that before your, yep. your, your banter came off more aggressive, right? Like, people had a negative perception of you, but now everyone just kind of hears anything you say. They're like, Oh yeah, that's just Gilius being Gilius. You know, he doesn't mean anything by it. So, how did you well, change your, your branding over the over time? Um, so, so to the tweet that I made to you, <clears throat> it was more like challenging you to keep playing competitive, because mm -hmm. the way you tweeted was that you had a lot of offers and you still went mm -hmm. streaming, and I believe that you still had something to prove in NA, because I watch NA ever since season one. Mm -hmm. And I, b I believe still you had something to prove. You took the easy route, but mm -hmm. I still respect that you're really very successful now with what you're doing, right? So back then, I, I didn't mean to like offend you or like hurt your feelings. It was just a challenging tweet. Uh, took it a bit wrong, but it's all good, you know. <laughs> the challenging tweet. You are shit. It's like, oh, no, man, I was just challenging you. Yeah, I don't want you to take that wrong or anything and get yeah. offended by that and get emotionally damaged. I just wanted you to know when I said you are shit, I actually meant you're really good and you should keep playing professionally. Yeah, and it was actually, it was actually meant for inspiration. <laughs> How could anyone misread that, eh? Well, I uh, I think Jesus you had some clutch moments in your career. and um, Sure. Um, I think <laughs> the way you talk on Twitter was always fun because you were one of the band guys. So I always said... Uh, I always liked you because of that as well. And yeah, I just suck to see you go from competitive, but it's fine, you know, I, yeah. we, we talked it out, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that for me, a lot of it uh, came down to just like not really wanting to put myself like into the grind for like commit to another year and do it half-assed because I feel like for, for me, my career, I, I always tried to, you know, give it my best. I'm sure all my teammates will attest to that. I was never one of the guys I was like playing other games or any of that shit. Um, and after season five, I was like, damn, I don't know if I, if I have it in me to like give it my best. And I don't want to like devalue myself and my career by, by going in half-assing it. And then like actually being like a, a middle tier jungler, or, like a bottom tier jungler in LCS and then fucking getting replaced like that. Like I'd rather end my career where I'm like confident in my ability and commit to something else that I wanted to do 100% of the time because I felt I felt like passion for streaming like it was exciting it was new it was like oh okay like how do I manage this whole new thing where I have to you know talk to sponsors and I have an editor and I'm trying to like create YouTube content I'm trying to collab with other people I thought that that whole like environment was so new and, and like refreshing and you I mean I'm sure you you, you kind of feel it um, in a way but after like five six years in the competitive scene it becomes a lot more like it, it loses the novelty to you so it's no longer like holy shit i'm a fucking pro player like i'm playing on stage is the greatest thing ever it's more like okay this is the day-to-day -day. this is how i live my life yeah but he's cracked that already mate because your problem was you stayed in the same team well two different teams basically it was like dignitas and then curse basically yeah. you just stayed in the same core for years so you're right at, you know you were just there the same challenges he just changed his team every split so it's always not all same. he's like great <laughs> fuck who are you cool this is it. it's <laughs> awesome i mean you're seven still don't even know these fans like, you know, yeah, not bad. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it must feel good that you actually have have a team that Keep you stay fresh. on this uh, this year. Like from going through all that change. I mean, like two years ago, you were you were uh, well, I guess three years ago at this point, you were on Vitality, um, came in, and then 
you had the the the, the Kiki's got you again, man. We just got to say it how it is, and, and yeah, of course. Yeah, and then you blue it, shelled him like always. Yeah, blue blue shelled him, <laughs> and then from there it's like you're playing in Turkey. You come back, you come back to Schalke. You play like two weeks. Like, did you feel at any point during this last like three year stint that you were gonna get a a solid chance again with the team? Yeah, um, sh- sh- surely eventually you just think to yourself like. You know, you can. You there's only so many teams, right? You've been in almost every team. Well, not really, but it feels like it. Like, do, do, are you? Do you really just have like unlimited optimism, mate? Um, yeah, and I really love this job so much that nothing can take it away from me. No matter who kicks me, benches me, I will always find a way to keep playing. And for for me, the issue in my last years was when I went to before I went to Vitality. I think I was very high on the ladder. I was smurfing in Spain with giants, winning many tournaments and promoting, right? And just saying winning these tournaments always meant that I handshaked self-made on the losing team, Nemesis and self-made. Okay. I think I won three to four trophies versus them and handshaked them when I beat them. Um, okay. mm-hmm. But yeah, other than that, uh, I was pretty high elo and I got many offers when I promoted uh, from multiple EU teams and I chose Vitality uh, because they like they said they get Yamato and I always really liked Yamato and uh, mm-hmm. the roster kind of I had a say in the roster I could bring my my guys over right and the mm-hmm. issue was when I actually I think I got too overconfident I got too complacent like I never was in a position where I actually won many games in a row. Like, I was fucking 7-1, 7-0, I don't know exactly. Mm-hmm. So I felt like I own the world. I felt like nothing can stop me. But in reality, playoffs, in playoffs, I lost in the semifinals to cap the Caps' reckless roster from Fnatic. Yep. And kind of my confidence really broke down from there. I was like, holy fuck, did I just lose to Broxa? And then <laughs> in a VO5. And then like no no offense. No no offense. No no offense, you know. But uh, I mean Broxa is for sure he has his place in the jungle. I think no, it was teams, overrated though, come on. Yeah, I, I think Junkos was always better as example. But yeah, that's just me, right? Um, oh, I did. So I think then I just went into this fucking hole, you know, like emotionally where we did a boot camp after su- spring split in Korea for one month, for four or five weeks in Korea. So I was already like burned out from mm-hmm. the spring split. And then I went to Korea and had to practice against, like we went to fucking Africa Freak's house. They like invited us for an in-house scrim set. And what it was, was there was fucking 30 Africa Korean people and watching us getting fucking destroyed by the main team, you know, like Spirit, <laughs> Tucson. They would Dude, after they the games. You. They wrecked you. It's amazing. Yeah. They invited they, you around. You're all thinking it's yes. like a fucking honor. Oh, it's amazing. And then they just sat around. This is fucking amazing. Watch this. Exactly. Look at him. He's getting destroyed. He's getting destroyed. Yeah. Record, record everything. Record everything. <laughs> so, so I thought this is all friendly. I'm there to like yeah. hang out and like do some photos with Spirit and Mowgli and all these. I really liked them. They were cool to me. But holy fuck, they just destroyed us in scrims. And... Oh, wait a minute, dude. Is this why Mowgli joins the team next year? That's why they picked him up. What the fuck? They were just... Dude, he can't go anywhere in the world. Wherever he goes, if he goes to a fucking kebab stand and the guy's too good with, like, the micro putting the chips in the bag, he might be replaced by the chip guy next year. He has to watch his back everywhere. It's, it's either Kikis, who's just, like, a master of disguise. He's just everyone in the fucking room. Or it's just if he goes anywhere in Korea, it's just, like, the next year, he's like, oh... Oh, you might. What are we doing for season eight, mate? He's going. What do you mean? I've already got that Mokley guy. What that guy we were playing against? Yeah, the one who was sat behind you for like three weeks watching you play. He knows all your roots now, mate. We don't need you. Yeah. Like, sound cool. Yeah, basically it's reasonable. And and then the uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Torin, yeah, that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> and, then, and then I um, I started out the summer split um, kind of poorly, and we were not winning every game. We were actually like going. We were standings 2-2 two, two or something. And then, okay, all this Kiki's drama, I, I think everyone in the scene knows it now, and I don't want to lay it out here because I don't want anyone part of it to be affected. Short, uh, uh, how do you say it? Long story short, yeah. basically. I thought we have no fucking chance to win the split, and I told Vitality, yo, 
please let's get a mid lane sub and a jungle sub so I can play with uh, the mid lane sub and uh, Jizuka can play with Kikis. And there was no fucking mid laner to get. And then I told them, yo, can we just get a jungle sub? Because I actually cannot, I cannot scrim like anymore, like fucking every day. It's like we're losing every fucking scrim, you know? It's for my mental health, it's not doable. And Vitality was super professional with this. They were like, sure, take your time. And I was the stupid kid who was like, yo, can you guys just fucking sell me to another team? I'm sure another EU team wants me. There was interest, but it didn't work out. And then I went on a long holiday. So that, that's the short story. I don't want to go into details. And after that, I was fucked, you know? Like, the community thought, yo, Gilius just got benched. They went to fucking Worlds. Uh, Kikis is so much better than him. But it's, it's kind of not true, you know? I kind of built most of the stuff up. I was part of the progress. I was part of teaching Kikis also how to jungle again, right? But this is never said, and Kikis never gave me props publicly about anything. But mm -hmm. I don't need any props. And then I went to fucking Turkey, you know, because there were no offers. And... Yeah. And then I went to ad hoc and yeah, now I'm here, you know. So you think it was mainly like public perception being lowered because the because everyone thought that you just got benched by Kiki's again. They're like, oh, the, like Gilius is, is getting benched for Kiki's. He can't be that good anymore. And teams actually internalized that and decided to not give you any, um, you know, like res respect going into the offseason. Okay. Yeah, little story about Kiki's coming in because I see Kiki's on Twitch chat right now. The example because yeah, he he, he, he probably for, he probably he wants to join the show. He probably thinks he's come on the second hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Just, okay. Gilles actually, Gilles, Gilles, you can't Gilles, do that. Yeah, yeah actually, okay. Gilles, can you can you pause for a second? We got to get uh, Kiki's in <laughs> here to replace you on the show for no, 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 just like uh, okay. twenty minutes or something. Okay. So before I forget the story, one okay. second, okay. <laughs> go for it. Go um, for it. Go for it. So Kiki's came into the house. I like him, you know, we met each other in the, in the past, we were like good friends, everything was good, right? And yeah. then the first scrim he played, he played Trundle, and it was unbelievable what he did. Like, he, he did red buff, and then he skilled pillar level 2, level 2 ganked mid, and mm -hmm. nothing happened, and the game was ruined. So my scrims, when I played, were also getting ruined by my play, and then Kikis came in, and it was fucking ruined as well, so we were both <laughs> shit. And then I went up to Kikis and said, yo, bro, because Yamato told me, yo, please teach uh, Kikis as much as you can so we can make this work, so we have two junglers. I was like, sure, man. Like, I'm a professional. If coach tells me something, I'll do it. So I went to Kikis. I told him, hey, man, when you play Trundle, please skill W level 2, clear three camps, and then gang mid. Don't fucking ruin the game. And you... <laughs> you basically, because fucking Broxa yeah. and Junkers were fucking destroying us, you know, in these scrims. Mm -hmm. So we were sharing scrims, scrimming Fnatic and G2, and we were just getting pounded by Junkers and... and Roxa. And then he became so, so quickly so good. And I think I was part of that, but it was never talked about. But then Kikis took over the show. And that's, that's all I have to say about this. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess there's a lot to unpack there. One of the first things you said uh, was that you were really surprised by Fnatic beating you. But my perception of Brox in 2018 is different than my perception of him now. I actually felt like when he came into the league, he was much stronger. Like, he still ganked. He still was playing the game. That's, like, when he was playing a lot of, like, Elise, and he had signature champions. Obviously, Worlds 2018 is the, the peak of his career. The best, uh, probably, we've, we've ever seen him play. Went into that tournament, was one of the, the best junglers in that tournament. Did you, like, I know you, you were memeing. You're like, oh, man, holy shit, did I just uh, lose to Brox? But did you actually respect him at that point, or do you think that he was overrated even in 2018? Um, so f f the, the problem I had with him was in scrims, he would keep up and play very well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when I plays, played him in official matches, back then it was stage matches and yep. it was kind of my, my field, you know, I just came from Spain and played like seven lands in Spain. So I was like a stage player and I would like get the better of him in most early games, even though I felt like I had the weaker roster. Uh, I was on Vitality and I faced fucking Reckless Caps, uh, so as Hilisang. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting 10k gold leads for my team by just outpathing him. And it's definitely a team game, right? Like, I, I have to give props, obviously, to my coaching staff and my teammates that were doing a really good job back then. But yeah. I, I felt like it was kind of jungle difference. And then when I faced Jankos, as example, on the other side, he had like a bit weaker roster than Broxa, but he was giving me a harder time. So, uh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So you thought that Yankos at that point was still much better than Broxa? Uh, I mean, Yankos early game has always been one of the best. Uh, no question about it. In scrims on stage, mm-hmm. what Yankos does in mid and late game, obviously, can be very improved on. Um, but early game wise, in in scrims, usually early game matters the most because, yep. um, yeah. Yeah, of the culture. a ton of kills, and, and yeah, the game ends relatively early. People don't want to play that much macro, so... Um... By the way, earlier on, when you were talking about that angle on when you were in Vitality and then you were replaced by KK and later Mowgli, who apparently was the guy from Freaka that everyone's practicing with, right? What do you actually have to say? Because I know Yamato on one of my shows, I still can't remember which one it was, though, unfortunately. I think it was maybe someone in Insight. I think it was someone in Insight, actually. He gave this whole philosophy that he has on League of Legends, right? That's about activity and precision. And his logic is, you know, the more active a team is, so like the best example would be like an LPL team like IG. His, his logic is if you're super active, maybe you don't have to be super precise with like executing all the moves it's like your your approach is like volume in this scenario like a boxer or something mm-hmm. so like did he have this sort of philosophy it sounded like this is the philosophy he developed in vitality have you heard any of this stuff before was this something to do because i know your team was super famous for being active really early in the game when you mm-hmm. were in the vitality team right um yeah i i definitely think he coaches in a way where he wants to map to play in a very fast pace and if you have a lead, you want to choke out the enemy till they can't breathe anymore. Basically, you don't give them a chance to come back. And his coaching has like a structure. Basically, there's a he will give you his like I remember all of it. Uh, I cannot talk about it, mm-hmm. but it's like he has a structure. He tells you here you have to do this and this and think about this and this. And this guy, when you do this play, has to think about this. So you have to be in the back of your mind and you have to think about the enemy moves and your moves. So like very strategic stuff. And like, it's really hard to explain honestly without an example, I'm sorry. Yeah, but okay. uh, yeah, basically he really helped us play aggressive and he really drafted for us to get these winning matchups. Basically Kabochat was, I think one of the few guys playing Lucian top and making it work, you know, so. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, the, so one of the the uh, issues that, that I kind of have always had with the teams that, that Yamato's coach is like they haven't been able to to push through at the end. Like it seems like there's always been a fall off. Like they start out really good throughout the season. And then when it comes to like semifinals, finals, they're never able to like actually cross the finish line and, and get that trophy. Do you think that that's uh, just a, a result of the teams he's, he's coach not being that good? I mean, obviously like Rocket Splice not being just top tier teams. Or, or do you think that um, the the play kind of has a, a limit because you are playing like super aggressive and you're able to dominate a lot of the weaker teams, but teams that are able to uh, you know play better throughout the game, not fall into as many of the traps and just stabilize throughout, um, are just able to, to to beat a team. So do you think that like the play style that that he coaches has a limit and it's not varied enough, or do you think that it's just a a, a a situation where he didn't have the uh, correct pieces to actually win a championship yet? Mm, I think he never had the correct pieces. Uh, like his ideal way of playing the game needs five very mechanical and smart players, like mm-hmm. mechanically strong and smart. And I think that's probably the first time now in his career of coaching, at least, that he has a shot to win a title if his coaching works Mm -hmm. and i mean g2 also has a coach that i mean coaching staff and players that played many insane events and have so much experience on LAN. so it's going to be interesting clash you know and i I basically i agree with you that like he didn't have the correct pieces yet you know Mm -hmm. how much uh do you value coaches in in general um because it seems like you you speak really highly uh, of yamada but we've heard uh different things right like Perks recently uh, was on a, a podcast and the translation, which people deem to be accurate, was that he believes that a lot of coaches uh, in the scene right now are, are kind of less useful than, than people might might think. That like I think he said maybe some of them are like stealing paychecks. Some of them don't really have the um, like resume or they don't have the impact on the team that other people think. Uh, what do you what's your interpretation of coaching within esports right now? Do you do you feel like you you gain a lot from your coaches or do you feel like it's kind of just uh, like a management a glorified management position? So <clears throat> I used to think coaches 
don't bring me anything and they're useless. I used to think like this when I started playing. Um, now that I played for many, many years, uh, certain coaches helped me to play better, you know, basically. I think under Yamato I played good, under Giotto, you guys know Giotto, right? From yep. uh, under Giotto, yep. Yamato I played there. very good, yeah. And under Dylan Falco, at the start I was playing like shit, because we were not on the same page. And now that I actually understand what he wants from me in the game, I'm playing very fucking well. So it's about what, how the player, what the player can get from the coach. So Perks basically is a player that has won so much and has, it has gone so over his head, probably, I would believe so. I mean, if you win this much as Perks, then yeah, you must get to a point. Insane. Yeah, your ego has to be out of... Of course, like, yeah. Right? So yeah. for him to say this, I think makes sense. I think for a player like me who hasn't won a championship yet, not really. Like I take a lot from these coaches because Dylan Falco, as example, went to Worlds Finals with Fnatic. Mm -hmm. He's teaching me things I never fucking knew, you know. So yep. that's my take on it. Yeah, I, I think that probably for Perks there has to be some some level of uh, knowledge that he gained from you know working with Mithy for so long as your support. And you know Mithy right now is considered a, a pretty respectable coach uh, coming over to C9. He was with Fnatic last year, um, so. Potentially, what I see from Perks is he probably learned more from Mithy than he could have learned from from any of the coaches that uh, he had because he got to play with one of the like all time greatest minds within Europe. Um, but yeah, anyway, moving moving forward, uh, I I just wanted to kind of broadly talk about uh, your your personality and like your social media presence and and who you portray yourself as because during this period it's, it seemed like uh, people had. I, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I kind of wanted to go more in depth with like how you feel like you've changed. Uh, people had more of a negative response to like when you bantered, when you're like, oh, I'm like the best jungler in Europe and whatever. Like in Vitality is like, man, this guy is such an ego. Like I, people were rooting for you to lose. But now when you when you came back with Shalka, everyone seemed to want you to succeed. They they love the miracle run. They like that, that God Gilius is back. Um, do you feel like you've approached banter differently or approached social media differently? Um, as your career has gone on to try to come off better to people because of like the the negative responses and potential lack of opportunities that you received because of uh you know who who you are mm, so i i always try to be me on social media so when i go silent then it's because i have some issues that i'm going through and if i'm tweeting a lot or tweeting regularly i'm there you know i'm being me um i prefer to like not tweet much when there's like drama evol like around me because it just makes everything worse. Mm -hmm. And I think I matured basically uh, a lot in the last two years when I had a lot of time to self-reflect when I was actually getting benched left and right. Mm -hmm. uh, basically a long time made me a better human being, I think. I was always kind of in my life, always around uh, uh, many, many people and when I actually went to Ad Hoc, I had, when I was at Ad Hoc and in, in Turkey in Besiktas, I had a lot of alone time where there was no one, like the, I had teammates that I was friends with, but sometimes I was just being there alone in my thoughts. And I just realized that I don't have to react to all the small noises surrounding me. Um, social media, if someone calls me out, I don't have to respond. I can choose to respond. Uh, back then, I thought I have to respond to everyone and like fucking fight everyone on social media. Uh, <laughs> now I just think if someone calls me out, I can think about it and maybe it doesn't make sense to write something or not. I'm just trying to be a smarter guy, uh, trying to be a normal person and trying yeah. to be a good person, you know? Yeah, I guess, I guess the second part of the question was, was, was that self-reflection just like because that's how you want to be or, or did it have some, uh, you know, did that happen because of like you feeling like you weren't getting the offers you deserve because of um, being like maybe like a brand risk or, or something on social media? I mean, I, the, the the issue I had was everyone always told me never change, always stay yourself, right? And then mm -hmm. when I was being myself, people said, "Man, this guy tweets too much. We cannot <laughs> sign him for the else? team." I actually lost the job that was an insane opportunity for me in the LEC because the guy called me, a very famous GM. He said, man, I'm, I'm scared that the sponsor that we just signed in franchise just cannot 
cannot tolerate your tweets. And I said, what, what is wrong with my tweets? He said, yeah, they're just so loud, you know, people like, like basically, I don't know what the fuck he was trying to say, but basically my point is, I just realized I have to do less to get more sometimes. Like I just, this off season, I thought to myself, let's not tweet some bullshit. Let's just do three challenger accounts while Worlds is going on. So people know that on the Worlds patch, I have three challenger accounts. I'm very good at the game. So I get good opportunities. I don't have to do any drama. I don't have to do some mistakes on stream where I end up not getting a job. And then what happened was I got many offers actually after the America run. I had an offer after the America run one week after the America run to stay in Schalke. And then uh, a few NA options, a few EU options. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I don't know what to say. Yeah, would you would you ever consider North America again? Because I know I know you came here for E United, um, yeah, uh, a, a while ago. But I just I, I wonder if you'd actually come back because it seems like you're one of the the types of people that, that thrives in in the EU environment. I feel like NA might not suit you as well. I actually think complete opposite. I think when I went to NA, I mm -hmm. was doing so much damage that people were so fucking scared of me. Like, uh, <laughs> I think I was eight zero in the Challenger series. And sure. Team Liquid was last place. I think Steve, the owner of Team Liquid, he he was so fucking scared that I will relegate him. He got Rainover, Double Lift, and Piglet into his changes in, in his in his fucking team to stop me from promoting. <laughs> um, that was right before franchise, so you had to secure your spot, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I was screaming. I was in E United Challenger Series. I was screaming all these fucking NA teams. I was destroying them left and right, like no joke. There was not a like. The only jungler that was actually, in my opinion, kind of good, like Dom, I don't want to put you in that box because you were not playing back then, yeah, sure. I think. Tarzan in solo queue. I know people fucking hate this guy in social media, mm -hmm. like some people. <coughs> this, guy, this, this guy was playing really good in solo queue. Um, then there was, who else was there? Santorin. I mean, he's a kind yeah. of a, he was a meme back then, like as a what, but he was like, he had world's experience with TSM. He was doing good paths. So mm -hmm. there were not many junglers that I thought are better than me. So I think I would have a good shot if I went to NA again to be good there. Here's the question, Gilius. Basically, here, I've told you years ago this problem, mate. Your problem is this, is like your banter. There's different settings on the banter machine, right? And the point is... If you want to go to the Conor McGregor setting, the top <laughs> setting on the machine, you have to be Conor McGregor. Like, Conor McGregor himself didn't do that at the beginning because it would have looked silly. Like, if he'd have come with the full bravado when he was, like, you know, 2-0 and zero in the UFC or whatever, it wouldn't really have caught on as much. In fact, it might have turned some people off because, like you say, like, if some people just don't vibe with it, they just don't fuck with it, right? So the problem I always had was you always tried to go too high. Like, I think you should have just gone a bit slower with the set, you know, like, ease into it. Because another thing is, as well, one thing you haven't admitted when you retire, tell Dom the answer there. It's like you also take banter personally sometimes, true? Like, you, you, you know what? So normally, if you want to do that, like, I don't claim to be mega at that, by the way. I'm good on camera at doing that. I never claim that I don't take anything to heart. But, like, I know it's hard to do that because when people throw shots back at you, if they're good, if they actually land, it stings, of course. So the problem is I've always been impressed by the way people can actually just take all banter, you know, all the time. I'm actually quite impressed with some of the G2 guys. Like, those guys aren't faking it. They really do make fun of themselves. Like, they actually can handle it, though. Like, I'm impressed with that. Yeah. But not everyone has that. So I feel like that's the thing. People have been unsure on you, mate. They weren't sure where you, like, where you just choking all the time was some of it serious i think people are, you've been mysterious to people in that regard i think uh, so, so the, the thing about it is trash talking for me gives me like an adrenaline rush when i'm actually playing the game mm -hmm. it's like my thoughts are like holy shit you said this shit you have to fucking perform now and it's like when i actually win the game after i shit talk someone the feeling i feel is like mm -hmm. priceless you know like it's, I don't win any money doing it. I don't, I, I'm not making my enemy happy with it. Sure. But then being humble to my enemy opponent and shaking his hand after I just fucking destroyed him and I called that I will destroy him, that was like kind of addicting for me. Mm -hmm. And I kind of didn't want to lose that. But I realized that when I'm fucking losing, I have to lose that really fast because it's going really, really against me, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I, I, I love bantering before the game and i also think many esports players 
kind of doing the doing it the wrong way. They like get shit talked, and then after the game, they're like, "Ha ha!" Like retweet the the the, the guy who's ha I just fucking smashed you. You know, it's like I did this as well, and it feels so fucking bad. Like I think it's Zerk's shit. Yeah, it's really wack. Like Zerk's the trash talked me. I think one time, and I like uh, really just like fucking beat him. I didn't even say anything back. And then I retweeted this tweet and said something. Didn't feel good at all. I was it's like, just passive aggressive, isn't it? It's not. Yeah, that doesn't count like a win. It's like they lost, but you didn't win in that one. I feel like that's yeah. whack as well. The other yeah. thing is as well, mate, is like, I, I think you're right with what you said earlier. Like, especially in terms of trash talking, less is more. Like, if you can come up with a really amazing trash talk, like, it'll be super memorable. If you do it too often, like, your style also was always so extreme. Just like, I will 3-0 with you every time. It's like, mate, that's like the best team in the world you're talking about. We talk about. Like, listen, if I wanted to hear some, like, sort of awkward, unfunny joke delivered in a poor execution manner, for scoring's on the broadcast for that. We don't need you for that, mate. Like, you know, we, there's other people there. Just leave that one. Let that one, let that one just go by. Let it, listen, let it just float up the stream, like, you know. I thought, All right, you sent, a, it off, <laughs> you sent it off, man. You sent it off. I don't know why. What do you think, though? What do you think about the approach? Uh, yeah, first of all, I like Froskurin's, like... Some people laugh, too. Yeah, I, I didn't laugh at the joke, Froskurin, <laughs> if you're watching this. Uh, oh, no. Um, she, she knows what that feeling's like, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what the um, she, come on, keep going. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, basically, the... The, yeah, I I definitely agree. I, I think Torin, you have a great mind for this. That's why I closely follow your Twitter. And when you trash talk TSM as example, it's not like you're not doing it like stupidly like I did. Sometimes you're like really finding the little marks that hurt, you know. So yeah. that's what make it's it unique. All, uh, yeah, exa exactly. Give like it's not special. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the, the thing about Torin's uh, TSM tweets is. There's, it's, it's just like, it's almost like the volume makes the bangers like not sting as much because like, it's like damn, there's like 10, there's 10 bangers in the same day. It's like, it, it's almost like we got to like space them out. We got to give Thorin like yes. a one TSM tweet per day quota so that he can get like all 125 out over the entire season. It'll be content for ages, but um, I should definitely save some of them like in that fucking drafts thing on Twitter. Like I've definitely yeah. blown too many in like an hour before. Like like when yeah. they got, even when they actually to be fair, even when they won LCS, I was still fucking firing them. So it's whatever, isn't it? <laughs> just what it, it's just what it is at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's true. And right. Also, I won't lie. There is an element like this. People who know my online persona know this is just the way it is. Whenever it's any of the topics I always talk about, like TSM, fucking reckless, forgiven, frogging. I guess we don't really talk about forgiven anymore. But when he was an active player, you know the topics. I was, oh, we're going to in a second. <laughs> I also do. I don't really like. It comes out of nowhere. It's like everyone's just sat there, like drinking some coffee and then i'm just like and another thing about the way that reckless put they're like what the fuck why yeah. what's even going it was even having this conversation i'm like no i'm just picking up my thoughts again like and i just keep it going as though it was one long conversation that's never ended basically yeah no I, it, it's so it's so funny because <laughs> since it's so constant people will be like in, in different mentalities like bjergsen will have retired and every every tweet uh, tweet from everyone yes, in the scene will be exactly. like wow bjergsen was such an amazing player you know like this guy was was the hope of na so much respect for everything that he did without his career one of like the best professionals we've seen within the space and then like thorn will be like yeah and like does anyone remember how how jensen just outperformed bjergsen at go. every international event for <laughs> yeah, his entire nothing. fucking career and go. it's like what the hell, man? Like, just let him retire in peace. <laughs> oh, I definitely have that, by the way. It's a thing I took from Christopher Hitchens. Is he? He also was a believer that, for example, when someone dies, you don't have to all just be super nice to them just because they're now dead. Like, if they were your enemy, for example, <laughs> they did some fucked up shit. You still write out a piece of them that basically wrecks them. Yeah, of course. I, I believe that. I think it's real. I, I agree with you. Like, there's definitely mm -hmm. tact. Like, I wouldn't say that if I was at Bjergsen's house and his mom just came in. Obviously, I'd be like, guys, you haven't got a bikini on this time. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I'm man! What the fuck is wrong with you? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good guy. It's a good callback. I'd be like, oh, that's uh, no, a quite fully clock. No one remembers enough. that yeah. even, dude. <laughs> oh, that's straight fire. No, but I obviously I'd just be like, yeah, you. Someone's really good at the game and all that. And then I'd wait till I left and just go. But yeah, uh, Jensen's way better. No, obviously you gotta have tact on there. So, but by the way, I, I never understood what. what <laughs> I never. <laughs> there was a banger tour and good one. Uh, by the way, I. <laughs> Why did he actually retire after going zero six in groups? Like I, I, I don't know myself. Yeah, but, but but how can you do this actually? Like I know he's fucking rich and all, but how can you actually <laughs> coach a League of Legends team and coach your mid laner when you know your last worlds was zero six? Like I could not live with myself. By the way, I would even even if I was was Bjergsen and would not find a job in NA, 
I would go the extreme. I would go to fucking Brazil as Bjergsen and try to just go to Worlds. Just as go a... to another Worlds one last time. Yeah, like, or like go to back to EU. That's even more the simple one. EU teams would love to get them back, right? But yeah, agreed. I, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's not my. Do, th- you, my... do you think that was the weirdest part about all of this? Is that of all the discussions, right? When Doublelift retired just now, we all had the same discussion: like, should he have stayed playing? Could he have played? Could he have played for TSL? Like everyone in, t- in the world of League of Legends just accepted that Bjorkson was just retired. I agree with you, Gilius. Like yeah. for me, it's yeah. like a crazy topic. Like in my opinion, he at least had a couple more years left in him. It didn't even look at the end like he was bad. It just looked like he probably he just got bad. sick of the situation he was in. Yeah, exactly. He probably just had low motivation. And I'm sure and this is the real problem I have with it as well, Dom. I mean, we, we can tie this back into when Gillius was flaming you for retiring to be a streamer, right. is when people stop being a pro and they start to become streamers, the first obvious thing to do. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is that's actually probably, at least at this point in history, a shorter term life, uh, like career lifespan than a fucking pro player. Like right now, no one knows if you can be a huge streamer for 10 years. We know you can maybe yeah. do it for like five years. Some people maybe a little bit more, but obviously you have to switch games maybe at some point. Like to me, people are taking it for granted that forget double like maybe you act like bjergsen's got his new career maybe bjergsen only does a split coaching maybe he doesn't like it no one even knows this yet so in my opinion all that stuff was really blown past fast because just because people know it's like inevitable like he's not going to turn it around just because we tell him not to but i feel like there's loads you could still discuss with that yeah i mean i guess, obviously, I guess... the eu one's the obvious angle right why not do one last year just to I mean, see you know just he could just even give it a go. he could even do a boot camp i mean okay COVID is really fucking unlucky okay but True. let's say let's say COVID does not exist. I could imagine a Bjergsen boot camping in Korea maybe for a month, in China for a month, streaming from there, from these two places, yep. St- boot camping in the EU for a month, and then come back in the summer split and just roll over people, right? But yep. he just went into coaching, and now he committed to coaching, and he can't come back in summer, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's the same thing with... Um, with double lift retiring. I think these guys, these two have the same mind when it comes to this. They are just sick of spring split, first of all. Double lift and Bjergsen, the only thing they play for is Worlds. Yeah. But well, why do you... Okay, double lift still has the option to come back in summer, and I believe it's going to happen. Hmm. No fuck, like, there's no way he's just retired. Like, he's streaming... I don't think so playing. either, yeah. Yeah, double lift is for sure coming back in summer split, and then Bjergsen could have done the same, and then holy fuck, and then A team could get Bjergsen and double lift for a summer split when Wales comes around. Yeah. But yeah. Put it this way. Right now, double lift is trying to do what fucking Loco does, where Loco is like, no, no, guys, guys, I'm, I'm like, you've had this, Tom. Where it's like, I'm totally out of content creation. It's not for yeah. me, you know, I've moved on. And then it's like, you go, okay, Loco, fair enough, enjoy your life. And then you turn around one day, like, it's like, new video. Why are it? Is everyone joining TSM? You're like, what, what the fuck is this video about? All right. So you message him, like, you, you're doing something local. You, you're back in the seat. No, listen, I'm out. I'm out. I'm just, I just made a video, just one off. The next day, it's like CLG's new run. I'm like, look, look. What, are you in or are you out? Like, the point is, this is why I'm bringing up the local example. The reason local won't 100% leave is because when you 100% leave, you're just whoever you are in real life, then you have to start your life over, basically. Like, start a new career, start a new set. Like, you can always be someone in eSports. So, in my opinion, I agree. I think Double F will find his way to play again, mate. I don't know who. Like, maybe he's waiting to see if TSM fails and then they beg him to come back. Maybe that's his storyline. I don't know what the angle would be, but I agree. I, I think if he gets it. a chance to, he'll play again. Yeah, it's, As I keep saying, I, so, the real problem is this, is that you have to play so much to get to the point that him and D- Bjergsen want to pick up on. They really just want to finally get that one good Worlds run, right? So what they want to do is be able to skip to the end of the year and just go to Worlds, but you can't. Like, you have to put in so much work to qualify for Worlds. Yeah. Like, that's their problem. I agree. It's like, it's, it's like, at this point, it's called, like, diminishing returns in English. Like, every yeah. year, it feels like it takes more effort, but you don't get anything extra out. You don't get a big reward, do you? Yeah, so I mean, I think that they retired for different reasons. And I I think that all players retire for different reasons. When you're going into like the streamer example, there was a mess. So the reason why we saw, because people have this narrative now where people that retired in season four, season five, like were just like washed up like Cutie Pie, Dyrus, Voy Boy, myself, like all the people that became streamers, people have this this mentality that like those players could no longer compete in North America. That's definitely not true, by yeah. the way. Like, mate, Voy Boy definitely could have played a few more years. He okay. was pretty good at the end. Yeah, of, of, of course Voy could have played. Of course Dyrus could have played. Like, it wasn't like there's a progression, right? Like, if you're exiting the scene and you're fighting to be in it, it's not like you go from like top team yes. to fucking out the door and you're just some random fucking hobo on the street. It's like top team, then like middle of the pack team, and then like teams that are in the bottom would definitely want to have a player like that. But the problem was in those times that there was a massive 
divide between what you were getting paid as a pro player and what you're, you're sure. making uh, from from being yes. a streamer. So people like Cutie and Voiboy, like I wasn't I wasn't even big when I like, started. I'm sure back then he made ten times more from streaming than playing. Right? More than ten times, more like twenty times. So like I think Cutie Cutie in season five, the the first time he he got into streaming, this is before he figured out all the sponsors, before he figured yes. out to go into YouTube, just based off just streaming subs ad revenue all that stuff he's already making over a million his dignitas contract is under 50k jesus the cost my streaming so fuck? so i was a new streamer right cutie literally took me under his wing and like built me up and fucking i i owe so much to that guy for like being able to like kind of explain to me hey this is how streaming works if you want to get into it like follow this path and he put me on the right path so when i quit i was the second highest paid jungler in north america the highest was medios he was making low six figures like maybe like 100k something like that i was the Makes second sense. highest paid jungler in the league and I was making 60K. And the first year I streamed, what? I streamed for 10 months. I didn't even stream the whole year. I streamed 10 months because I was playing pro for the first two. And my income was was around 300,000 without knowing anything about the system. I didn't know, I didn't know how, how to do YouTube. I didn't even subscribe or I didn't even um, get partnered on YouTube and make revenue from my YouTube channel for the first for the first six months that I did it. I had 150,000 subs. I was getting 200,000 views every video. And I didn't even monetize it because I was getting like baited by somebody in my org that was telling me that I was getting some custom curated deal on YouTube and don't <laughs> sign up with that one, man. Like you're gonna you're gonna make more okay. from what we're getting. So I just got like fucked. But that's without even knowing anything. So it wasn't like this, this decision where it was just like, hey, do you want to do one or the other? There was also this huge incentive where it's like, hey, by the way, the job that's less stressful and easier to do is going to make you five times as yes, much. Which like obviously isn't the case now. Yeah. So that was like the whole incentive for, for people back until the end of season seven. So like Shifter dealt with the same thing. Like Shifter, it's I like, I have hey, a question. Go for it. Do you ever, okay, I know you're like living the, the dream life right now, right? I uh, believe so. Okay, maybe okay. not for you, but for all of us, right? When when NALCS starts the week one, are you mm -hmm. a bit jealous that you're not playing there? Like, be honest, by the way. I, I do you feel like yeah, you're missing out? Yeah, yeah. do you so, get that sense? So I so I was at the point in in season five, and I'm pretty sure I would feel the same way. I hated scrimming. Like, I really hated scrimming. Mm -hmm. I think it was because of the culture of our scrims. I never felt like there was that much improvement. I felt like people just scrim to scrim in, in North America at the time. And people didn't give it their all, so it's, like, really hard to actually figure out. Like, like, we would have so many discussions where it's like, so would you actually make this play on stage? Like, that would be the the, the, the token thing we'd say in scrims. It's like, is this a stage play, though? Like, would you actually go for this on stage? And then it's like, well, I need to play like this in scrims to test my limits and, like, all this bullshit. And for me, it's like, we're not even getting anything out of this. We're just, like, playing like fucking animals and dying everywhere. It's like, okay, it's very basic things at that point where it's like, hey, you know, we're doing dragon. Like, you're playing weak side top. Just don't die for like 30 seconds. And but it's like, no, but does. I need to, to I need to I need to to test my limits. I gotta try to 1v2. Like I wanna see how far I can push it. And it's like, what do you actually gain out of out of that 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 situation? So I know you're shaking your head, so you've probably dealt with the, with the same type of thing. I've dealt with this kind of shit, yeah. Yeah. So I for mean, me, I felt like the scrimming was miserable because because I wasn't happy in my environment. I didn't feel like that in season four. In season four, I really enjoyed my, my teammates. Like I was really good friends with like cop. Voy boy, Quas, uh, Buddy Fufu when he was on our team. Like I felt like the, the like the brotherhood, the, the good environment where you know you scrim and then you go out to eat with with, with the, your team and you come back, you scrim again, and then you 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 get dinner and then you like you, you want to spend time together, you want to like uh like solo queue, duo queue together after scrims and it just feels like a family where it's like damn this is the dream life. That's what I felt like was the absolute dream. I think that's probably the most fun I've ever yeah. had in my life was season four because there was so many people around and I just liked my whole environment. And then it was like, I would go to LCS and, you know, I was getting positive feedback from the community. So it's like, there's no downside, right? Like, uh, I mean, the only thing that would have been better is if we actually ended up like going to Worlds or winning season four. But in season five, I didn't feel like that. It felt like straight, straight job. You know, like I didn't really like the people around me. They weren't like my type of people. Um, and it just felt like I was just kind of grinding and I loved playing on stage still, but I hated everything else. And I feel like, that's something that I always try to tell myself is like, yeah, I always love playing on stage. It's so fun to like play on stage. If you, pl if you play well, if you pop off and like everyone's hyping you up, <laughs> that feels amazing. <laughs> like, Cause the problem is Gilius has got a look on his face. Like this story's lasted longer than some of his fucking careers in certain teams. <laughs> mate. Like, like yeah. he's just waiting to jump in anyway. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say, yeah, sure. I just, I just wanted to say, I, I know the issue that you had, mm -hmm. how you didn't enjoy scrims. Yeah. And I realized the way G2 and Fnatic was practicing in EU for many years is now, they are showing everything in scrims and they are fucking smashing you. Mm -hmm. Until you are at the point where you're like, 
Mm, are they just getting screamy low right now? No, okay, they're just smashing us. And then they keep doing it over and over, and they expect you to have a counterplay for it. So yeah. the, the new culture in EU, scrims in, in EU now is uh, both teams try to fucking smash each other, and both teams are tryharding in, in draft, you know? There's like, yep. th there's no mm, hiding picks or this and this. It's fucking war, you know? And that makes it fun for me. And yeah. I think when season five, season six, that was also like, there was so many like veteran players that had the mindset. And I actually had this as well at some point because someone brainwashed me into it. Yeah, don't yeah. show anything. Yeah, don't show anything in scrims, man. They will find a strategy against it. And then mm. now I'm at the point, I'm like, mm, what if I show them three strategies or four strategies and I have eight ready, you know? So mm -hmm. it's like, good luck countering that shit. I have like more, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand your point. So I, I want to also hit on the Bjergsen double lift um, situations because I think that their retirements are, are different. I think we're, we're kind of looping them into the same discussion where it's like, oh, they both retired because they're only looking for the, you know, ultimate prize. I feel like Bjergsen's mindset has always been one that like he wants to actually be the best. And I think at this point he realized that it is no, is no longer possible, at least within his mind, that given all the effort, he could potentially be like the best in the world and win worlds. Like he actually is somebody who I truly believe like you can criticize all the decisions he made all you want. Right. And like, he's a human being. He made bad decisions. I truly believe that he did everything like everything that he did. He thought he was doing it to try to win worlds and be the best player in the world. Like that's how he thinks. So him retiring is more like, He's given up that goal and he doesn't want to play and potentially play to get out of groups or play to uh, win another championship in NA. Like that doesn't really matter to him. So that would be my um, interpretation on Bjergsen. On, for Doublelift, I think he was kind of like forced into retirement um, in, in a way because he didn't want to play with uh, the, the janky version. On a bad of, team basically, yeah. yeah he, I think the Doublelift <laughs> is more like, I don't know if, if insecure is the right way, but it, it seems like, like he's more insecure with his career than 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 Bjergsen is where he doesn't want to potentially like play on a bad team and have that devalue him or like have to like go through like a lot of turmoil um, to get the results. Like he just wants to play on like a top team and be one of the best and, you know, go to worlds and, and whatever, and try to get out of groups there. Like that's where, where his mind is. So I think the double lift retired um, more because of circumstance because, you know, he got kicked from TSM, didn't have a place to go to. Um, and just didn't have the options to, to join one of the top teams. Not joining TL, not joining C9, kicked off TSM. Where are you going to go? None of the places you're going to go. Gonna win There's team. one angle that people never talk about as well. Like, let's be real. It's not like those other top teams didn't pick him up because they think he sucks. Like, the guy won, like, eight of the last fucking, like, ten splits he played in or something mental. Like, mm -hmm. the reason they didn't pick him up is exactly because of the problem he's now facing, that the perception is he's not going to give a fuck about spring split, and he's just going to dial it up as he starts to care during the year. So in my opinion, like, it's obvious people should want this guy in their team, but, like, that just shows that once you become too much of a burden, like, people aren't going to gamble on you. Like, I bet there's a bunch of teams, if you could delete that part from their memory, would have given him a chance this year. I mean, I, I just don't think the main two that look like they're in positions to win, TL or, or For C9. For obvious reasons, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like they actually have better ADs. I mean, uh, Tactical is, is, is super young, super hungry, like plays solo queue all day, all night, plays these in-houses whenever he can. Like he's just trying to be the best player possible, loves the game. And, you know, Double famously did not play that much uh, in Spring Split. And he, he kind of just wants to like get everything together towards the end and make the best uh, appearance possible where people like Sven and Tactical are grinders and they're also really fucking good right now. So it's hard to make a case for double lift against either of those guys. And maybe I have a theory. <clears throat> maybe it was also a money issue with him not being able to play with Sword Art. And maybe if double lift really wanted to play with Sword Art, I don't know any info on this, but I could just imagine why would TSM not want to keep double lift, right? Maybe double lift could have taken a pay cut maybe. Had to play with Sword Art. I don't know. I could imagine it could have happened. Because why would you not want Double Lift plus Sword Art, right? That, like, it's like, may maybe actually the new TSM AD carry is better than Double Lift. I don't know, right? I have never yeah. seen that guy. Mm -hmm. Would yeah. be what I was thinking as well. It could definitely happen. I mean, these, these players, like, like lost. The main thing that was gating him was just the fact that he was an import. Um, and, you know, Doublelift is not an import. So I feel like the, the conversation of Lost versus Doublelift never got to actually happen because of the circumstances of the team. When the team was built, it was supposed to be built with, um, you know, uh, yeah, with, with Doublelift plus, uh, plus uh, uh, I think it was Huni that was, was going to join, and then they're having yes. Power of Evil, right? So it, it, it was essentially going to be, hey, we have our two imports, we can't get another one. Now OC players are 
uh, considered national players. So uh, Loss is able to play. I actually think he'll, he'll be pretty good. And I, I like the combination of the young AD carry with the, the veteran support more than I like, like two veterans that are very stuck in their ways and are going to kind of be pulling at each other uh, for um, how they want to uh, play the Wait game. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, though. I have to set the expectations for this, though. When you say that, like, I actually think this TSM line is mad and underwhelming because it's fucking TSM, dude. Yeah. Like, it's supposed to be a team that challenges for the championship. Like, you think this ch- team is going to challenge for the title? I don't think it'll challenge for a title, but I think that well, I think, to me it looks like the fourth best team or something. Like you know, like yeah, it's, I, I, it's so, not TSM that ain't good enough. Yeah, it's it's like third or fourth. It's like a third or fourth roster for sure. But I don't really attribute that to the bot lane at all. Like I have really low opinion of okay. me right now. So, but that's the problem I have with it is like when I'm looking at the main players, like all of these players in theory, maybe the lost guy's a bit of a reach, okay. But aside from that, right, most of these players I wouldn't mind having in a team like this. But they have to be with, like, a superstar. Like, if you want to have Hooney, that's cool. You can have Hooney. Who have I got as mid and AD? That's my problem. Every position I move to, it's like, like that's all right, but who else have I got? But And I never get to the superstar at the end. Like, yep. at the end of it all, Power of Evil's my superstar. Like, the whole point of Power of Evil, if you want him, is to just be a really good mid and then have, like, your superstars, like a fucking AD carry or top yeah, player like or top something. Player. Like he's more, yeah. he's, more, he's more clutch than you guys think, actually. I, mean, I, I played with him in the team. Problem, mate. Okay. Here's the problem. I think he's a good player, but he's not a guy who can just 1v9 the whole game, when, especially not when we play against Koreans, he, mate. That ain't going to happen. He can't in BO1, but POE can actually clutch out a BO5 as a mid laner by, by himself. All right? This guy has some creative idea, like picks. and Sure. The way he plays mid lane is like a wall, you know? It's hard to break this wall. Like, if, you, if you're not, like, super fucking good on lane, you're not going to get an advantage with him. Mm-hmm. And he is actually, I, I think him and Swordart are very fucking clutch players for BO5, potentially, if they get a good seed, you know? Maybe yeah. TSM will be so shit in the regular split that they will be seed five or, or, or six, and then they will get destroyed by first place, right? Because yeah. number one and two in NA is looking scary as fuck, you know, like yeah. <laughs> Cloud9 and <laughs> Team Liquid, you know? Oh, they look stacked, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I, absolutely. I, I, it's just weird to hear that Power of Evil is a clutch player because this guy is famous for going to finals and, and getting second place. I think he's been in like five or six finals and, you know, he's gotten second every single time he's never won. So it, it's, it's, it's different to, to hear him... Uh, as clutch, but I think your explanation makes sense. Like the fact that he adds so much value and he's like kind of a scary player in those best of fives gives him some uh so, some extra points there. Uh, yeah, we we talked we talked about TSM for a while. I wanted to hit on this topic um, because obviously we got we got Thor in here. He he's uh, he before the season was really um, high on Forgiven as as a player. I was really high on Forgiven um, as as a player as well. I, I, mean, I think potentially, good. obviously not at that exact moment in time. Like he had just come back after like two years off or something. Yeah. But yeah, in theory, he could have. He had the potential to, sure. Yeah. Obviously, this guy played him, so let's get into it. Yeah, same. So so recently, you came out with a tweet supporting uh, Forgiven. I think you're probably one of the first people from Schalke to support Forgiven. It seemed like people were, were really against him within uh, within that that uh, atmosphere. So. What did you see see from Forgiven, or like, how did the the Forgiven experiment turn out in your eyes? Like, what was your perception of everything that happened? I think he was being himself with us. The for, we asked for the Forgiven that tries to win and talks his mind, mm-hmm. and he did that. And I believe that <laughs> as a team we couldn't handle it, and we we were not good enough for him, basically. That's what I, what I actually believe now in hindsight that I thought of it, about everything. The reason why everything went to shit is because we were he, he like we didn't let him feel like we were good enough to play with him, and he needs that from his team. Mm-hmm. And the boot camp before the season was fucking insane. Forgiven was destroying people in scrims. By the way, it was actually peak Forgiven. He was playing really well, and then Riot Games decided to. In, in a span of fucking two weeks, bring out Senna and Aphelios. In a span of two weeks, they brought out two AD carries that are fucking broken. And these champions were not thought out well, by the way. There was an Aphelios in my scrim game, apparently, just came out. And his fucking weapons were one-shotting me left and right. And then there was a guy, uh, uh, we thought about him like a hipster, you know, he just picked Senna AD carry or support. And the guy was shooting us down from 900 range and sniping people over the whole map. Mm-hmm. And Forgiven did not adapt to these champs. He said, we don't have enough time. He's a player that needs... He's like 
in that sense, kind of like Reckless. I remember Reckless said this in an interview. When he wants to pick a champ on stage, he wants to be 99.9% .9 on the champ confident, right? He, mm -hmm. He's not like a Perks who will just fucking first time something. Because Perks is just a different beast, okay? So Reckless and Forgiven, they're like more, they want to play their comfort. Yeah, comfort, I don't, of course. I don't know if Reckless is still like that. I don't want to put any words into his mouth. Like maybe he changed. Mm -hmm. So, and Re Forgiven was like, guys, I will practice them slowly. It will take some time. And what happened was we were not feeling confident as a team to play them yet because we didn't put in the time. And we banned 280 carries on fucking every side for two weeks. And then we went 0-4. Like, the scrims before that were good. Forgiven was playing good. We were a good team. And, it, and from there on, everything went to shit. Forgiven and me got benched in the same time. And then it's a fucking fiesta, you know? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Do you think he's still like good enough, or do you think he's still you know worth being in LEC? Definitely, I mean, definitely, no, no, no question about it. This guy is is a very good player, but he also didn't adapt to some things that were happening in the game. I, in the game, in the with Fnatic, I did a great path with a self-mate where I got like one level ahead with him. Mm -hmm. And what self-mate did after I kind of made him behind in jungle, he went bot and flashed on Forgiven, got a kill. We were not warding bot sides. Like, I don't know what the fuck was going wrong. Like, they were just not dropping their wards in the river. Or they were like, when I said enemy jungle is bot, they were just dying. So, mm -hmm. it's... I, I, I don't want to excuse anyone and I don't want to flame anyone. It was just not meant to be, I guess. Like, yeah. So, I guess, I, so I, I guess kind of what I'm hearing is like the, the narrative around him being like... Being like hard to work with is somewhat true, but the value that he brings still shouldn't be, um, you know, diminished. Like the fact that that he is a, a strong individual player, like a strong mechanical AD carry, is is still a, a relevant thing within within League of Legends. So I put it like this: when Forgiven talks to me, like he talks to people, mm -hmm. it, I will listen and I will try to do what he wants right so mm -hmm. i will try to take it as a lesson i will not take it personally because sometimes when he brings it across points it can get personal you know like i don't know that's just his humor he's actually a funny guy like he he yep. makes fun of people all the time and but the way he looks he's like bald and looks <laughs> like a scary motherfucker with this huge beard so he's like he t makes a joke about you and has the straight face on and you don't know if he's like have, making joke right now or like being serious you know so yeah. some players on my team were not like they couldn't deal with it. They were like getting frustrated. They were like, man, like just play your game and let me play, play my game. And yeah, so it was hard. Yeah. The problem is though, none of that, that all sounds great, Gilius. If we're asking you what we did, ask you like, what was your perception of being in the team with him? What do you think of it? But as outsiders, we don't have to accept any of that. Like I accept none of that in this sense. As in, like, yeah, technically, forgiven in terms of skill at the game, in terms of potential skill, I heard the same things about Scrims, was like a good player. But first of all, he wasn't prime forgiven. And in his brain, he never deleted that. Like he still thought, like, well, I could get to that level. It's like you haven't done anything. Like, what have you done for me lately? That was literally fine. Five, four years ago now, mate. Like, you, we can't hold on to that forever. Like, imagine, think about this. This is the thought exercise. Imagine someone coming up to you in season five and going, in season one, I was the shit. So, like, shoe share or something. You'd be like, who gives a fuck? That was five yeah, years ago, mate. Doesn't matter, you know, yeah. It wouldn't matter anymore. But what Forgiven never got is, in his brain, that's eternal. Like, he can always be that player again. So, my problem is this. Schalke was the right level of team for him. He wasn't a player who'd played for years at this point in time. And last time I he played so was in the EU Masters. So, what he needed to do was prove himself for at least one split. And one of the number one things he needed to prove wasn't that he was a good player, is that he could actually be a competent teammate. And that is where he failed completely. That is the big problem. Like, I even think if you look at the first games that Schalke played, even though they lost them, like he was looking half decent in some of those games. He definitely hadn't like given up completely. He did give up like four or five games. It was obvious at that point. But I think he initially did go in with the right mindset. But when I look at it now, I don't think it ever could have worked, mate. If I look at that group of people, even the coaching staff, he didn't have the kind of coaching staff that could ever get through to him. He had the kind of coaching stuff yes. that like, you just have to hope that you're going to listen to them. And the one the problems forgiven always had as a teammate, it's probably the worst. The number one thing that will fuck you in a team game is where you're like a star and therefore on some level have to be a leader, but you think being a leader is just being a star. 
Like, I just play my role. I'm the AD carry. And at the end, it's like, well, I did my fucking job. What did you do? It's like, that's not a leader, bro. A leader's the guy who's like, right, you're having problems in your role. Like, I did my job well, but can I do something to help you in terms of how you play? Like, do we need to change something about the game to help? Like, that's a leader. A leader looks for solutions. Forgiven just has problems. He just tells you all the problems. He, 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 this, he was, he, this guy's wrong. He's fucking it up. I'm doing it well. He's fucking... It's like, that can't be leadership, man. That's, that's, not, that's how you destroy a low-level team. It's not how you bring them up. Sure. Yeah, I mean, he was trying to actually be the guy who's like actually doing the reviews and he was really trying. The issue with him was um, he just gives up on people too fast, I think, um, in a way where, so let's say I entered him, right? Yep. Game one in the scrims. So we have five games. I entered the game one and then... I'm gonna, like, he has this, like, if he doesn't speak out what the fuck, like, his problem is with me, for the five games straight, he's gonna have this back on, in the back of his mind, you know? So, it's like, clash of egos, I would call this team. So, there we had, like, the, the Odo Amne, who has his own opinions, and the way he talks is very loud, and he, he, he raises his voice often, and then we are forgiven, who is fucking sick of all the bullshit that's happening. He wants to win. He's like raising his voice. And then there's three guys who just want to fucking play the game. And we're like silently sitting there in this war room, you know? And when, when I actually talked back to them, it was fucking war, you know? So, okay, where, where was my fucking point actually? So, <laughs> my, my point is, Forgiven was actually trying to be a leader, Torin, by actually teaching the team how he wants to, the game to be played. But he just failed at it, you know? Like, um, he failed at being a leader because he just gave up. We are 0-4. He didn't get benched, by the way. He actually... Yes. A lot he of people don't get... know that. What they even told yeah. him, as far as I know, was something along the lines of, like, you and the other guy will compete for the summer spot and we'll just pay you the whole time and like, there's a way to come back in the future, right? Like, he himself is the one who made it. Like, it was like, oh, he just betrayed me. Yeah, I, I didn't understand that at all because I, 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 like, he he instantly... Um, okay, actually, I don't know how much I can say. Uh, basically, after uh, the weeks, I, I, I'm, I'm being told, I come to the office with good mood. I'm like, yo, boys, we're 0-4, but it's all in our hands now, right? The easy matches are coming now. We just faced some good-ass teams, like Fnatic and stuff. And then I was like, I was being told, yo, Gilios, you're not playing next week. Lurox is in. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I was actually, like, shocked. And then the, the Forgiven was, like, still in the team. And then <laughs> after a few games, playing with the now Lurox forgiven was like no nah, not happening I'm I'm done and then we were both out so yeah. uh, like I was actually I love this organization and now that they trust me it's great being here but I don't know what the fuck happened back then I know that I'm more expensive than Lurox maybe this was why I got just randomly benched you get a rookie in that like they 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 actually thought at zero four that it was fucking doomed already I I did not. Man, we were fucking 110 in summer and we made playoffs. Like, people have to trust a bit more, you know, and uh, let the flow come in. Uh, f maybe a forgiven <laughs> a guy like him going 0 4, being the underdog now, getting humbled in the first four games. Maybe it can bring a spark back, you know, but. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like what, what you said about, about Forgiven being a leader is just, like, not managing the personalities well from uh, from a GM side. Because I don't think you ever get Forgiven in your team and you're like, yeah, I want him to, you know, lead us to, to victory. I feel like you get Forgiven as, like, the piece of the puzzle where it's like, he, you want, like, solid AD carry play, you get Forgiven, and you try to surround it with people that are going to take that stuff off of him because he's always been best when he's focusing on the game. To me, that would be, like, the equivalent of getting a player, like, like, like the, the player I always compare Forgiven to is Piglet because they're, they're similar, like, AD carries, known for having egos, but, like, really good mechanically, not the best teammates. I feel like there's, like, a good, good parallel there. But I don't feel like you'd ever get piglet in a team and be like all right like you're gonna lead the team like you's gonna be the guy that that's yeah. telling everyone what to do I just feel like it's not his place so trying to do that probably was extremely foreign to him because he's not like the best people person he's he's more just focused on uh, playing the game also I just feel like in general it, it's it's weird to have your your ad carry be the leader of the team because in, in general from what my, work. yeah from my experience ad carries are just not like the people that are cut out to um to, to lead teams because they're not 
uh, people that have to, to interact that much. Like, AD Carry as a role is all about refinement and, and precision rather than being, like, uh, somebody who is good at working with other people or, like, coming up with plans within the game. It's more about just, like, hey, you stay in your lane and you... Uh, you know, play as well as possible. So I, I would I would have to criticize um, somewhat the per, the person that put the team together and thought it, it was going to win if they expected for Gavin to be a leader. Not not saying that that necessarily was the expectation, but if that's what ended up happening, I would be more worried about why are we in a situation where Forgiven is leading the reviews or he feels like he needs to lead or are other players not good enough? What do we do wrong here? He just did it by himself. No one asked him to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He For felt sure. like it's he felt like it's crunch time. We were still in preseason. Like we didn't even play a single match yet. And then yeah. the team already fucking broke before the season started. Oh. Yeah. That's Disaster. Crazy. I wonder if it has to do with expectations, because I mean people expected you guys to be a a team that could potentially challenge for like top four. Like you guys were the were the team where they're like, all right, Chalka minimum sixth, like at at best case they can you know, break in and, and probably be like a, a third or fourth seed because I mean, the Mad Lions people had them as pretty much an unknown. Uh, Rogue people were decently high on, but there wasn't that that solid. No like, expect anything from Misfits. It was a bunch of teams no one thought would be that good. Yeah, they were supposed to be a quality team. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then like teams like Excel just fucking stomped us, you know. So. Yep. Patrick That's also was... the other part that is, you have to say, though, that is so whack. It's like you don't go out after just losing every game and then quit yourself like a little bitch. Mate, I at least even waited till the end of the fucking Listen Local episode to quit for fuck's sake, and that's not even my job. Like, <laughs> that's I at least, I, exactly, at least the decency to wait like two hours in or something before I just fucking build. Like, mate, when you go out like that, that is just, there's no other way around it. There's no excuse. You are just a bitch. You just went out like a bitch. You lost every game to everyone. Everyone trash talked you, smashed it in the here, face, hung one on you, fucking left you out there, just jizz riddled in a fucking alley. And <laughs> you just dead. And that's it. That's the end of yeah. your fucking career. And then at the end of it all, what do you have to say? Do you come out with an epic interview? Do you come out with a big step? No, you just like a little bitch. You just go, oh, God, things didn't go the way I wanted. And I must always win. Like, by the way, that tells you everything you need to know about where Forgiven's head was at. Dude, he actually hit send on that twit longer and thought that was going to come off across great that he was telling people as he quits an 0-8 team that he has has to quit because he's got too high standards as a winner and needs to be like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, read the room. This tone is so off, it's unreal. And that's one of the reasons why I just don't fuck with that guy at all now because he still never got it at the end. People like me, veteran, others in the scene went to bat for this guy. Like, no, if you give him another chance, like, he'll be serious this time. He'll practice properly. He'll be a good teammate. He didn't do any of that. And after all of that, when we were like, but he's going to apologize. He was like, what do I have to apologize for? It's like, this guy never got it. He just never got it the whole time. So at the end of the day, just being really good at clicking minions, that ain't enough to be a, a, a legendary League of Legends player. You've got to have more than that, mate. You've got to be able to play the fucking game, and it's a team game. If you can't play with other people, you are not a good League of Legends player because it is a team game. There is no such thing as, like, the greatest player ever, and he was a terrible teammate. It doesn't exist. Like, you have to at least master some of those qualities. So in my opinion, he'll just go down as a what if player who wasted his potential. He never fully reached it. Yeah, I think I think that that makes a lot of sense. So, um, I mean, it, it, it sucks because I feel like he definitely does have have stuff left as a player, but you know, uh, it just didn't work out. And because of how he did go out, because it did like resonate so poorly. Well, with Devin so Bridge people, now, wasn't he? Yeah. I don't I don't see how he, yeah. he's he's coming back anytime soon. But I, I feel like just his individual skill was kind of diminished by the community because there's this problem that we have um, in League of Legends where if people are dislikable or if people are unlikable, they also just conflate that with you being a shit player. That's just how it, how it always oh, is. They can't just be like, oh, he's a fucking asshole and I hate that guy, but he's really good at the game. It never happens, right? It no, became... No. Forgiven is, is a is a shit teammate. He's he's a bad guy to be around and then also became... And he was never fucking good and he's a bad player. And I, I just hate that that's how... Everything yeah. is always shaped within the community um, that you can't have like both. You can't be a good player and be a bad person to work with. I'm sure you know about that, Gilius. I'm sure you know about that. I'm smiling <laughs> for self-made, sorry. Uh, yeah. I, I do believe... You don't even have to Tor respond to that. Tor Torin fucking... Torin like, said it in a fucking cruel way, but <clears throat> I would never phrase it like Torin did. Respect, <laughs> first of all. Um... Yeah, I, I'm sad that we could never see his peak. Uh, mm -hmm. Never saw the peak of uh, Forgiven. And I saw the peak in scrims. He was pretty good. And he was not making mistakes when ahead. 
We could never get him ahead. Sad way how it ended, and in the documentary that comes out on the 25th of December of oh, Shalke No Fear, okay. uh, yeah, um, the, you will see some insights on that. Yeah. So how do you feel about uh, next season go, going into it? Like, are you, are you, I mean, you seem like you're eternally positive, even with the, the miracle run. Uh, you're, you're the guy that everyone <laughs> said. Another fucking miracle run. Have you not seen the team he's on? What the fuck is this shit? Like, is that not, is that Schalke's new thing? Every year it's like, look, watch us do our next miracle. But of course, for the miracle, we have to first lose the first 40 games. Like, what is this shit? Like, just make a good team. I noticed, by the way, this is one of the reasons I hate narratives, Dom. I fucking hate them. Okay. Because I like narratives that are real, that are based on something meaningful. So if everyone was so all in on that miracle run, right? Remember, how many teams did he beat in a row, Gilly? It's like eight or something? Was it 10? Um, what was his win streak? 7-0 win streak and then 3-0 B of 5. Yeah. Yes, there you go. Oh. So it's 10 games if you count the yeah. first start of the playoffs and the run, right? So in that run, you beat every single team in the league, right? I think it was correct, yeah? So you yeah, beat every top that. team, right? So if your team actually believes in you, you just re-sign that whole lineup. Like, you've, you've cracked it, right? You've got something, the cord's there. There's a team that can come. So. Like, why, why, why break it up? Why blow it up? Makes sense. I think um, it was time to let go of some... Heavyweights, you know. Now I have a Schmerder top laner who does some Schmerder things. I think Respect. Odo was very good at micromanaging and helping the team to understand the game. He's a genius when it comes to map play. We don't need that anymore. I'm really grateful that Odo taught us a lot. And now we will fucking beat you, you know. Now, now I have a actual better top laner. Odo on this lane. forgotten more about top lane than your top laner will ever know. Show My respect. top laner, uh, I, I'm showing respect. Odo knows this. We are close. Um, but I cannot, like, I, I'm never, like, I don't think we downgraded on top lane. I actually think okay. we upgraded. Right. I think Some Odo's hype, voice right? being gone makes my voice louder, right? So it's on me now to lead us in a, in a way. And okay. I think Dreams, um, for me, the issue with him is he, like I never felt like he fully uh, felt at home in Europe. Like he's a Korean guy, he plays in different regions, but I never felt like he's like as example. Uh, how do I say it? If I say I want a Döner kebab, you know, and then Sagan says hell yeah, and then Abba says hell yeah, and then Dreams like ah oh, fuck off, you know, I'm gonna eat. Bit of or something, yeah, whatever, some yeah. Korean shit, yeah. And, and now I have limit. Where I, I feel like limit is um, okay. First of all, okay, nothing to take away from dreams. What we try to do is sign uh, like the likes of Hillisang. Okay, that was our plan. Yeah. I can just talk. Don't openly. know by the way, Hillisang was available this offseason. Like he, there was a world where he wasn't going to be yeah. in Fnatic again. Yep. That was our. I, I'm going to openly talk about this. We were like aiming for a Hillisang. When the Hillisangs didn't work and Dreams was being told he's getting replaced, which is fair, right? We thought like, oh, maybe Hilly, maybe this guy. Maybe some, we, we didn't get the insane supports, but Limit was always there. I always wanted Limit. I always told them, yo, if Hilly is stalling, I'm down to just commit on Limit because I think this guy is fucking talented. And Same. he, he fucking, like, I, I know Crownshot gets a lot of props for SK and I think he deserves it. I think Limit really made him also look very good. The bot lane was the, was the real strength of that team yes. for sure. Yeah, 100%. I was going to uh, say the same thing. So I, I feel like we got the, the biggest, best piece from SK that we could get. We could have gotten Crown Shot Limit as a combo, but we wanted to keep Neon because we believe Neon got the better of Crown Shot in the BO5. And mm -hmm. it does not make any fucking sense. If, I, if, if, if we play the Summer Split and we and Neon 3 zeros Crown Shot, you cannot fucking sign Crown Shot to that team. In, in my mind, that's not how it works. Obviously, Neon stays. Like... N Neon was in that miracle run, 10-0. He was beating He's a good player anyway. Yeah, he's a good yeah. player. So, so I think we are good to go, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the team um, will definitely be a playoff team in Europe. I mean, it's one of the better rosters. I, you look at, at the other rosters, they have a lot of, of unknown quantities where, I mean, Broken Blade, there's there's no chance that I think Broken Blade is going to be a bottom tier top laner in, in Europe. Like, the, the role of top lane in Europe is probably the weakest out of, out of all the roles. So I think that you plug in Broken Blade, even if Odo um, is considered slightly better, 
he's he's like a fourth, fifth best top laner in the league, and and I've always thought that Limit was was pretty good. I'd say Limit is a straight upgrade to Dreams. I feel like a lot of people tunnel on the Miracle War, and, and then they're like, oh man, like. Look at how miraculous it is, 10-0, but no one talks about the first part of that, which is like, yeah, they were like fucking 1-11 or some shit, or like 1-10. Like, can I, like can I jump in? Uh, sorry, Dom. Uh, the, the, the thing I said about, okay, Dreams also 3-0 limit, and then we signed limit, right? Yeah. Uh, what I want to just make sure people understand is... <laughs> and that obviously doesn't make sense, it goes against your entire I, point. So go I, I think I understood what you are going to say, but go on. On one. Come on. Yep, to, go for to it. Just, uh, to just explain it, okay? We believe Neon is better... Than crowd shot. Mm -hmm. And it didn't make sense for us. We were offered to get crowd shot, okay? Mm -hmm. Second thing, Dreams 3 0 limit, right? But we already told Dreams he's out of the team because we were aiming for the number one supports. I'm talking about 99.9, .9, the Hilly Sanks. Mm -hmm. So when Dreams is being told and then we don't get these guys, you cannot just bring Dreams back into the team. That's not how, how this business works. Yep. And then limit came in. So I just want to point that out. Uh, so sorry, Dom, for interrupting you. No, no, go okay. for it. I mean, I was pretty much done with my point anyway. <laughs> I just, also, I mean... by the way, why has no one ever brought this up? This is why you know there's not actually any quality entertainers on LEC. There's just a bunch of nerds who just have fucking figured out half a joke and between them that just makes them epic in esports. Like, Limit's actual real name in real life is Dino Tot. He has a name like a fucking 90s cartoon show about a dinosaur. <laughs> like, for kids. This is fucking mental. Why has no one brought that up? Why is everyone just calling him Limit? Why has no one brought up his name is Dino Tot? That is mental. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I always just, I, I had a meme with Limit in my chat for, for every LEC game because I, I just loved when he would like, when he would get up and, and he would like hug Crown Shot or whatever because it literally looked like Nunu and Willem from the game. He just looked like, he, like he's, he's like a 6'5", like, like big dude, right? And, and, and Crown Shot just has like the glasses, like the, the, the like <laughs> extremely proper looking like nerdy guy. So, you know, I just felt like, like that was such a, <laughs> a good fucking, a, a good fucking combination of support. You know, if I was an AD carry, I'd want a support like that. A support that makes me feel safe in and out of the game. So... Yeah, we, yeah, people we are fucking those. scared of him in real life. I can confirm that. Yeah, I mean, he was. I mean, Gillis, he's he's literally like what a, a foot taller than you or something. He's yeah, like a whole yeah. Um, head. head. Yeah. 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 Here's the thing, though, Gillius. Like the lineup on paper looks decent, but the player it all hinges on is the mid laner, mate. Because if the mid laner can actually play the way he did at the end of last split, you could have something. If he plays the way he did most of the rest of the time in Schalke, it's just going to be an okay team. It's not going to do anything. What do you want to tell me about this guy, Abadage? Yeah, so I want to also say that the fucking tier list from Veteran and, and Dom. Mm -hmm. Where did they put these guys? I never saw it. What was the what was the tier got, for the Abadage? You guys I... actually rated Chekolas higher than Abadage. No, I didn't I didn't rate that. So so just just for the record, I didn't rate okay. any players that are regional league players because I haven't watched enough of them to actually let know. So okay. I just let it with the but you associate with the tier list. Your name is under it. You tweeted it out. Sure. So it looks I, like I, you are. Right? Sure, but I, I went with the with the overall perception, and the reason why I had someone to do it is I was not going to do an LEC tier list involving regional league players that I haven't watched play. Like I yeah, watched a lot in, in EU Masters. So if there was to be a tier list, I okay. can put my you watch a lot in EU Masters. Store. EU Masters, man. EU Masters. Okay. Yeah, sure. sure. I'm Give sure. Me like I'm the top, what, what was like the okay. top four or something for mid? What was it? What was Fucking the tier? EU Masters. Tinks and ninety. By the way. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Torin, one second. I need to clear something up, okay? All right. We, sure. we have been playing scrims for fucking two weeks here in this office, and we have scrimmed almost every EU team now, except Fnatic, because they don't, didn't scrim yet, okay? Mm -hmm. We have scrimmed the, the likes of G2. We have scrimmed everyone. Abadage is absolutely smoking everyone left and right, okay? okay? And one reason for that is also, we just signed his best friend of his life. Yep. Broken Blade is his best friend. They yep. have started together okay. as 15 years old, 16 years old kids. If I had my fucking best friend sitting next to me, that's like pretty OP, you know? Sure. Um, so you guys don't have the insights. So I don't blame you at all for the tier list. I just, when I read it, I get so fucking angry, you know, because so many people see it. But it's not, you guys are not to blame. You guys don't see any scrim results. You guys don't see sure. anything in scrims. And then seeing fucking things on a 90, self made 95, I'm like, I'm like, okay, you know? I can understand it. Self-made is pretty fucking good, you know. That's a reach fucking... on the Tinks one for sure. I, 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 I Yeah, no, it's no way. Like, and 
And fucking Dan? Wait, what was Dan? 87? Are you guys fucking kidding me, by the way? Like, so, hey, I, I, I couldn't believe I, it. I, I have literally no ranking for them. If I were to, like, rank them, I would have ranked them, like, between 80 and, and, and like, 75. Because that's just what I think most regional league players are going to come in at. I feel like it's very rare that regional league players come in and they're just, like, the gods of the role. Like, you get, you get lucky it's sometimes. The, it's, it's like Madden. Hard. You do, like, out of 100 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. That yeah. still seems I just, pretty I just, fucking I high. I agree. I feel bad for the rookies. You guys give them 90s and fucking and these points, and then they will get absolutely fucking shit on, you know? Let me just say this right now. There hey, is no such thing. There is no such thing in the history of League of Legends as a rookie jungler that would be anything above 70. Because even if it's self-made, I'll take the best one of the last few years. All he had at the beginning was sick mechanics and like a mind for ganking. That was it. He had to still learn how to play League of Legends, the game. He had to learn how to play with different teammates. Like, like no one can be that. Like, I think that role especially jungle is when you have to learn as a pro you don't come in like the, you could be an amazing ad carry and come in the league and be like Kazi and be good on year one yeah i agree I, like, you I, can't I, do it a draw like jungle come I've on that's, like, that's a fucking skill man. position it, it doesn't work by the way i, I scrimped so? them man they did their fucking eu masters shit puffings against me they're getting absolutely destro destroyed every game they're dropping okay. three jungle bands every game they cannot fucking brief against me they can't play the game yeah. they they learned all their fucking shit in eu masters when people are playing skana and zek now try to fucking face me, try to face self-made, try to face Junkos, and we will get abs absolutely des destroyed, you know? Gilius and then, don't, for don't forget Inspired and El Yoya, by the way. Inspired, well, El Yoya is regional all. league, right? But look at the team around him, his coaching staff will teach him jungling, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think a Tinks will learn jungling from SK as of fast course. as El Yoya from Mad Lions, right? And mm -hmm. I understand making self-made 95 and then I'm at 83 and then I'm like, okay, I'm fine with this. He played Worlds, I didn't. And then I see Dan and Tinks yeah. on fucking 90. But if, like, you, nah. if you remove... And then I went to bed, by the way. I didn't even tweet anything, I think. <laughs> oh, I, I actually tweeted something to you and yeah. I just went to bed. I closed my phone, flight mode. I was fucking done yesterday, you know? And the Sorry. thing is, if I rate you too high, then you wouldn't come on the show. So I had to make sure that, you know, we, we keep your ego in check. You know, you no, feel I, like I, you... I, I love the show, man. I, I watched the whole Ocelot episode. I, I think you guys are pretty good at this. So. Oh, well, I, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I think that, that for, for doing tier lists like that, like I'm doing the players that I know. I think if you go through like the ratings of players that I, I, I gave it, it makes sense from like a, a one to... Um, a one to like six or seven because there's so many uh, regional league players. But I do think it's really hard to um, to judge how good a jungler is going to be. I don't think that the junglers are, are always like bad when they come in. Like there's so many junglers that I can think of that came in hot. Like for example, I mean, I don't know if you guys are going to think this is too long ago, but I don't know if you, but do you guys remember Dardox debut? Like, Cops. I mean, mm -hmm. sure. If they, if they go straight from solo queue to competitive, like instantly, like you go solo queue to like LCS, you're going to look like shit. But if you have the training, like, so for example, Dardock got to scrim against me when I was in, in season five summer, when I was like in my peak form. So like he got to, to experience all like the hard lessons of, Hey, you path like this, you lose the game. Like he got to experience that. So when he got to stage, it wasn't like, Oh shit, I have to play against pro junglers. Like he'd been playing against a pro jungler for his entire time, came in, hit the ground running and fucking smoked everyone. Like it wasn't even like close. So I, I think that there are times where you can see junglers come in and be extremely good. I felt similar to Inspired in, in, in Summer Split of Season 9. Even yeah, though Rogue agree, yeah. was, was a bad team, like, or, I mean, they weren't even that bad. They, they ended up getting, I think, top four Inspi that split. Inspired was not a rookie, though. Please don't forget this. This guy, what, Larson why is and him, rookie? look, Inspired and rookie, Larson were called rookies Ultra in League. the LEC. But they, they played for ages, by the way. Inspired has been in the top 20 challenger ladder for years, but no one ever gave him a shot. And then yeah. he just, you know, he, like, my, my point is, <laughs> look, if Inspired is, if Inspired or El Yoyo, these guys, I think, are good. Mm -hmm. Because I played versus them, and I think they have a great mind for the game, and they are rookies that you should rate highly, okay? In yep. the tier list, I would give them good points. And then Dan and Tinks, I faced both of them, and I've see, seen them play. I saw a yellow star carrying Tinks' ass in EU Masters. I, I know he was four levels ahead on Graves, but that was maybe because he actually got to play Graves and the enemy didn't ban it, but that's another point. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to shit on any rookie for no reason and like take anything away. If Tinks plays fucking well in spring, I will give him the praise he deserves. But right now, as of how I'm thinking, 
sure. that SK lineup is not doing shit in the league. Um, there should be more focus on Misfits with Wanda. I think that roster. Also, Hirit. Man, what the fuck was that tier list? Hirit had 70 points, by the way. The top laner of Misfits. It's please, like some please, Korean. He's good. Yeah, man, this guy is fucking good. Like some Korean kid, you know, he's like doing really well. And whatever, Despite... if I talk about more, more about the tier list. These are two famous biases of veteran, though. One, he always overrates the rookies because he just sees the potential and doesn't look what they are now. And then two, he doesn't like Koreans, does he? So those are obvious biases. Well, you've got yeah, to factor that in. Obviously. Yeah, you've got to factor that in. You've got to know where people's blind spots are, you know. Yeah, I mean, I agree, like put it this way, I would say the same thing you do there. Essentially, but I'd make a more ridiculous version, which goes like this, right? If if fucking Tinks is a ninety out of a hundred, what the fuck is Canyon, mate? Only ten points better. He can only be ten points better. Like, what is this? <laughs> so Canyon's only, 10, yeah. Canyon's only about ten percent better. What is this shit? This doesn't make yeah, sense. I mean, it's true. It yeah. Then Tian is also one hundred fucking eighty, by the way, and. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, true, but I mean, the, th the thing that, that we structure it as is like, as you get it, it's uh, like, as you get into the 90s, it becomes like each percentage point means more and more. So like uh, the difference between like, okay. uh, yeah, the, the difference between a, a 90 and 95 is not the same as the difference between 95 and 100, like and right, 100 okay. exponentially better because that's kind of how it works in, in those games, which is what I modeled it after. If you play like NBA 2K, FIFA uh madden like you you see a guy that's like a 95 compared to a 92 it's like well one yes. of them you can you true. play you auto win the, the fucking game the other guy yeah. you play you can, can uh, barely do anything i so. actually messaged i messaged veteran and i said yo can you explain me this shit mm -hmm. do you guys actually want me to read it out i'm pretty sure it allows me to sure actually. i mean as long as it's civil yeah okay sure. no no of course man don't worry mm -hmm. um i think i asked him as well if i can read this out um if not then veteran Man, I never like would send any conversations. I just for this it I fits. I don't want pretty... to apologize. He has no problem just revealing shit that he hasn't got permission to reveal. So fucking, what's good for the <laughs> goose is good for the game. Go, go for it. Thorns is filled with the fucking bangers today. There you go. Uh, for, for you, the best aspect of what you were doing were were driven around top acceleration, which was in large part driven by how absurdly well Neon was playing, rather than displaying a strong fundamental understanding of jungle matchup. You have generally always been pretty one-dimensional like that historically. The benefits of you have always been that you are decisive, not that your decisions are necessarily next level or nothing. So he thinks junglers have to be next level, but whatever. That jungle, that single mindlessness, man, my English is not good enough, sorry, can That's work fine. really yeah. well when there's an obvious win condition to play for on your team but collapses otherwise, and since the rubber banding changes, is a far more vulnerable way to play than it was preseason 10. So he thinks, just to word this in a human way, so everyone can understand this. <laughs> human way, okay. He okay. thinks, so he thinks yeah, I got man, carried. Yeah, go yeah. He thinks I can, he thinks I can only play around top side. Neon was playing super well weak, uh, weak side, mm -hmm. carried me. Um, Junglers will fall more behind in, in levels. Yeah, and he thinks you next like game year. too much and yeah. Yeah. And and I have scrimped junkers and I can proudly say there was one game where I was five levels ahead when the X Nexus exploded. So I respect it. You can also like these narratives, he just makes them up in his brain, you know? Like he I I was not behind in levels in the miracle run. My last competitive matches. Okay, Shadow had the better of me. He picked the better matchups. He fucking outplayed me. I go, I'm gonna be honest. I fell into his Lee Sin trap. I was like, oh, I need to pick Lee Sin away. He fucked me on Lilia. Okay, mm -hmm. but the 10 games before that, dude, oh, I was out leveling. Yeah, yeah, I was out leveling everyone and pathing really sure. well. So I'm with lots of different know, champions. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck he's talking about, honestly. So. Yeah, I mean, I think all. that he's just talking about like the volatility of playstyle. I I think that uh, the overall concept makes sense because so when he talks about rubber banding to give that information to the chat essentially like levels 9 to 13 you gain more experience than before and you don't um and the rubber banding is uh the fact that you don't get catch up experience from camps the same way you used to so junglers that gank more have uh more susceptibility to falling behind like that's the issue that he's talking about but um yeah i think it just depends on on who you play with like if you're able to actually like understand how to play with bb how to play with abadage if neon um is, is playing well like he, he was before. I mean, I feel like Schalke will be 
like a like a fourth fifth uh, place team. I, I think Rogue. I think so too. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I actually have a question for you, Gillis. I forgot to ask it earlier. Since you played in Vitality for that period of time with Cabochard, mm -hmm. right? Can you give us any insight to this guy? Like, I know for years this guy could have gone to other teams, even better teams, bigger teams. He had the offers. Yeah. He used to have like the hype behind the scenes. Now, for some reason, in the year when no one gives a fuck about him anymore, because obviously Vitality had all those issues, didn't even have the real mid laner for spring, etc. And then the end of the year it wasn't that great. Now, what is he just not playing anymore? Is he just out of LEC? What the fuck? Can you give us some insight? I've also thought this guy was mad underrated. Yeah, so I, I can give some insight on it because um, because Ocelot leaked stuff here before, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. He said that 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 Vitality was trying to make that super team, right? Yep. Um, with the Alfari perks and stuff. Yes. Um, so I think uh, Vitality was probably like transparent to him and telling him this could happen, and then he was like, "Okay, I'm gonna look for other options." And it was kind of so late in the off season already that he couldn't find anything better. And yep. he also is a veteran player that looks at I he wants to be paid well, I could imagine. So how I know Cabo from the past, he would not play for free. Like I would do as example. He wants to be in a good team and he wants a normal salary, like what he's worth. So I think just unlucky, you know, um, and maybe also there's more that I don't know. Maybe the coaching staff uh, decided to go another way. Um, I I don't have enough insight. I just know um, he will be fine, you know. Uh, just he's... the person, though, mate. Like, look what, look, this guy had such an underwhelming actual career. Like, the idea he's never played in an LEC final is mental. Like, this guy is a fucking amazing player. Yep. Mm, I, I think he's like... I don't want to say too overrated, but as example, I, I in, in my opinion and from my experience of the past, top laners like Alfari, uh, Oduamne, um, Soes okay. always had got the better of him. Okay, mm -hmm. and then if you cannot, re if Cabo cannot surpass them, then he cannot go to the finals, right? He went yeah. to semifinals. Uh, with us, and I think he did it again, I'm not sure. But if you cannot surpass these top laners, you cannot make finals as a top laner. That's just the reality of it. Top lane is a, is a fucking stacked role. Like, yeah, Vizichachi versus Cabo. Actually, Cabo was the counter to Vizichachi. This is, like, I saw someone wrote Vizichachi in chat. Vizichachi had big struggle versus Cabo, but Vizichachi had a good time versus someone like Odo. So it's, like, interesting, you know? But basically, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I I understand what what you're saying. I think that the top lane just has like it's it's top heavy, so it's stacked at the top. But like the six through ten, it just it's, it's random, right? Like when you have players like like Arome and Finn going to Worlds, like I don't think that 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 shows that like top lane is having much influence in what narrative actually wait, narrative. Wait. They're actually not bad, by the way. It's actually a narrative. About wait a minute, wait a minute. So we just spent a whole year of our fucking lives wasting our time on all these narratives dumb about like is a robot good enough by the way in the end apparently the entire league decided he's not good enough and yeah. nobody gives a fuck about him including mad lions coaching stuff like this is mental why are we wasting time on narratives when they're not real like this is nonsense well, like I mean, the entire league is now literally going to men in black pretend I, this guy didn't exist this is mental <laughs> I, I, I can just explain it sure Aroma it. and Shadow were fucking great in Europe when they played in front of the office computer, and it was all comfortable. And then, when they went to Shanghai, and the pressure was on, and the surroundings changed, and you had to plug your keyboard and mouse into a different computer, and sit not on a beautiful backforce chair, you had to sit on a secret lab chair from Riot. Mm -hmm. They choked. They played like they, they played like shit. Sorry, you guys didn't make worlds. Like, yep. But Oroma and Shadow were doing a great job in the league. And that same narrative is going to continue this next year because COVID, this motherfucking COVID shit, uh, God bless everyone who's affected. I hope everyone is okay. Uh, I hope this shit ends so this narrative can end because there will be online players again this year. Yes. Next year, I mean. Mm -hmm. And yes. there's going to be a player when summer split, potentially when COVID stops, 
he's going to go on stage and shit his fucking pants. Well, that's, and, that's the big criticism of one of your teammates. That's what everyone's saying about Abadage. It's like, Abadage is good when, when everything's chill, but you put him on stage. I mean, that was what, what people were saying about Schalke. If you guys ended up making worlds, Abadage is not known as a stage player. So do you have any worry about that? I mean, I have talked to Abu about this actually myself, mm -hmm. and he told me, I told him a few we uh, months ago, hey man, you should change to a wireless mouse. Um, people who actually play worse on stage compared to at their home, it's usually because of their mouse cable, you know? I have had this discussion with so many pro players. They went to stage matches or offline events and this fucking cable, you know, you get like, you don't have the cable, like you have it at home. And now yes. I have this, like, there's like some game changers that I know because I've played many LANs. Wireless mouse, um, how you your diet, because your diet needs to be different, because when I play from office, I can just eat a cheeseburger before the game, and I'm going to play good, because when I yep. play on stage, I'm going to be more nervous, my fucking, I'm more stressed, I have more, um, Adrenaline. more things are working, yeah, so all of these things, I can teach him, and we will make it work, I believe, and uh, yep. you, they went to Shanghai Mad Lions, and they didn't make it work there, you know, and I, I don't, I, I don't like that Shadow and Aroma got fucking bullied like this because they had a they fucking choked. But Shadow was also a rookie and Aroma was also kind of new, you know. Uh, give them a break, you know. I mean, I, I, I so I didn't really shit on Aroma as much for Worlds as I shit on him just like during during LEC because I, I hated the narrative that this guy was like the the rock in the top lane, super stable, can play carries but just doesn't need to because it, it, he he's in a team where you know he has carry players. Top player, so why the fuck isn't in the LEC, Dom? Because here's the problem, right? It's one thing if Mad Lions coaches do that. I get that they were in the position yeah, where course. it's awkward. You don't want to talk about cutting your own player. But everyone else on the show used to agree. They all used mm -hmm. to be like, no, but he is really good, and then none of them want him. It's yeah, just exactly, nonsense, exactly. Isn't it? It's, it's just a, absolute nonsense. Every, everyone's like, you know what? Aroma is actually great. It's like, okay, you can have Aroma. It's like, no, 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 no not for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, Gillies is like, oh, Arome is great, but I mean, Broken Blade. I mean, we got to take Broken Blade over Arome, right? Like, that's that's just Dude, that's come, a no on, come on, you <laughs> cannot you cannot compare BB BB one NA. Of course, to, of course. Who can you actually, compare it to though? But but BB actually went to the real worlds, you know. Yeah, Aroma did not. Yeah, and you yeah. know what? It must have been they won the same amount of games. BB got it, didn't he? <laughs> BB got fucking it, and that's all. Yeah. Just do it. So there you go. No, and also, yeah, at least Arome knows how to sit back and be carried. Broken Blade's like, whoa, fuck, oh shit, what do I do when I got to go to any carry? Nothing, just fucking chill. Well, no, I mean, mate, I, I, the, I think I think Vivi's actually is, good. It's just, it's just he's a good player. Who who's he's, actually going to be exposed this year, though, mate? Who actually wants to have uh, a Romeo on your team? Let's say let's say you're you're a team like like Vitality, and one of uh, the players that I have actually followed is, is Segenda, right? Like, I think that Segenda actually has a, a lot of talent in there. You know, he looks like a player that could potentially shape out to be really good. Would you take a player like a Rome over a player like Segenda if you like, yes. You would? Yeah. I, okay. I would I would just take both, yeah. I would just take Segenda into Academy. And I would do it man, when I'm a coach one day or GM, if I ever get the opportunity, you guys will see what fucking what I will do. I would put fucking Segenda into um Academy or Roma into the main team and then we we see it from there. Pay them both well, you know. I don't think both are way too expensive. Ooh. And then if Aroma plays his regular games well, he's gonna play. And if Zagenda, if he's if he fucking ins like he did in Worlds, he's fucking out and Zagenda plays. So, um, yeah, that's how I would do it. it. It could it could be an option. I'm just saying that from my perspective, I feel like Arome is a limited like quantity. Like it doesn't seem like he's able to actually perform on champions that you need to play as a top laner. So I feel like Arome plugs into a very specific team where the team is like stable um and you just need like a tank top player to not lose you the game and the rest of the team is going to like be able to 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 carry most of the weight but i don't think that that works in in every single team and if you compare it to other players that you could get like let's say you're rogue and and fin leaves and you have the option of oduamne or or Arome. like why would you not go for the player that has the the flexibility to be able to play everything it just seems like it's we, so limited to to get a player yeah, like Arome. We, we, i would never put finn and Arome in the same box so i think um they're so different players, by the way. Like, from from one guy, you get some... Like, you say Aroma is more tanky guy, right? Yeah. And and Finn is like a actually... Guy. Yeah, like more of the carry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think he ever got the opportunity to play carries in Rogue, because the... 
because of just how the team works, right? So I could see Finn just fucking popping off in CLG, by the way. Like, yeah, I, I, actually, so. I, I actually thought about it. Like, this guy is so underrated because of Worlds. And there was one interview I think Showmaker did that, like, made everyone hate Finn for no reason. Showmaker said he watched, like, I watched the whole interview. Showmaker said, I watched a game of Rogue, and this Finn guy was 60 CS behind in yeah. one game. I don't think they're gonna be a hard opponent for us. That's all he said. And fucking Reddit and Twitter took it as Showmaker just called Finn the biggest dog shit player. You know, they like they they rounded it up, making him sound like he's like the worst top laner. You know, there's a reason why Finn also won the regular fucking. They won the regular split, right, Rogue? Mm -hmm. They were first place. Oh, right? in, in the yeah, the, the, the best of ones. Yes, yeah, they were and, first place. And in scrims, they were dangerous. Finn was actually fucking dangerous to us in Shalk as well. In scrims, this guy always had some picks ready. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, Reddit, I, I, so. I think I think Finn is is much better than Arome. <laughs> that was that was literally where I was going with that. Is that and when when you saw them both play against each other, Rogue three owed Mad Lions, and and Finn just played tanks every single game, and Arome had to to pick the champions that were OP at the time, Camille, etc. And we got to see. We got to see a Romeo on carries, and I feel like he got exposed. So, I mean, I've... I've I guess I've he always... got exposed, yeah. Makes yeah. sense. So. I, I think I've, I've always been uh, low on him as a player. I just... I, I don't like when, when players are in top teams, like, because there was that time where Mad Lions is, is the best team in LEC, and every single player just ends up being mad overrated. Every single player is the best in their role, or, you know, one of the best in their role, and Mad Lions is fucking coming out on ESPN rankings as the number two team in the entire fucking world. Like, it just gets so crazy to me that I feel like I have to pull the narrative back to Earth, because it's so... It's basically you know, the top point so equivalent of what happened with Broxa. Like, dude, after all those years in Fnatic, Fnatic fans believe that shit. They now lie and pretend they don't, but, like, they really believed he was better than self -made back in season nine whereas you saw when he went to team liquid he was nothing compared to self-made like self like twice as good a player as him so we're not hitting on him we're just saying by being in the top team he got overrated so did a Romeo, of course yeah it makes sense like yeah. these and the real problem i have is this is like it, it's okay as long as the team doesn't believe it as long as the team themselves knows and they actually will be like a proper sporting organization that's fine because one thing i do worry about is teams that are near the top just like sticking with the same players for no good reason. Like, I don't think you should do that, actually. Like, in my opinion, you should do what Ocelot's tried to do, which is every year, if it's possible, you try to go for upgrades. Even if it shouldn't be possible, like, even if you look like you've got the best players, because the point is, maybe there is. Like, you know what? I tell you what, I know they didn't actually do it directly, but put it this way, Reckless was a better AD carry last year than Berks is. So there we go. Congrats. He's upgraded a position. Yep. Now, it doesn't matter that you're the best team in Europe. You always go for number one, in my opinion. So I, I think, like, that's the problem with those narratives is when they actually, like, do affect people's careers and someone just gets, like, signed to a bad team because of it or they get to stay on top teams when they're not good anymore. Like, that's when it's just nonsense, in my opinion. Yep. I'm just also surprised that Origin actually ended Summer Split last place, okay? Yeah, without far. Dead last. Mm -hmm. Dead last. And Upset is on Fnatic now, because he's fucking good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alfari is on Team Liquid, because he's fucking good. Yep. And these players on this whole roster did not get the same shit that Oroma got. No, of course not. Because they were hidden during Worlds, while Oroma was in the spotlight, right? Yes. So I, my only issue with these narratives is that a, a guy like Aroma, because of a Wells performance, has to pay such a big price. Now he's fucked, yes. you know? Like, I don't know where he's playing. Uh, Nordic I, I don't... Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And the guys from Origin, they're chilling, you know? Xerxes even got a job in NA. Uh, I think Destiny and Xerxes are both in NA. They're chilling. Yeah. Um, I agree yeah, with the premise, though. I know what you mean. Like, put it this way. It basically hurt Aroma's career more that he went to Worlds than didn't go to Worlds. Like, yes, that's, basically. There's nothing a bit stupid about that. I agree. Because put it this way. It's basically like the discussion you were having before about Tinks being rated. Tinks essentially got to be a 90 out of 100 from playing stupid EU Masters with the best shot caller to ever play in fucking Europe yes. uh, in his game, playing against Babbies who don't even know League of Legends and half of them aren't even going to be in that team next year. Mm -hmm. And he gets to be a 90 out of 100, but Cadrill, because he's just on XL that didn't make playoffs, is what? Presumably like nowhere near 90 i'm gonna guess i'm gonna yeah, guess he's like, like 60 or something you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he'd be like 80s so, or so like that's 80s. it's like what what even is this test 
That's like you've aced the remedial class test, so you're now a fucking honours student, but I'm stuck in like the second class because I was just doing sort of well on a decent. What is that? Like, I agree. Like the, the, the narrative's like almost like aren't on the same timeline even now. And, and I, I, would, I, I totally agree. And I would wish the league would just expand. You know, we just need more slots. Yep. We need like 12 teams. 12 teams or exactly. Like, I'm 100% with you. And, and then the fucking guys like Fabian, Nemesis, like I just want everyone to find a fucking place, you know? Oh, there's too much talent now for sure. Like, why the fuck is Fabian and Nemesis not yes. playing in our league? Because we don't have enough slots. I I think the rookies that are coming, like Veteo, um, uh, Chekolad, they, they deserve it to be here. But Nemesis and Fabian deserve it more because of their past. I, that's how I th I feel. 100% um, they're better players. Like, I, there's no way that you can sit me down in a room and tell me this blue guy is going to be better than, than Fabian or Nemesis. Like, blue is going to be better than Fabian well, or Nemesis. We don't know. Uh, but blue, blue is pretty fucking good, by the way. No joke. Okay. Guy, I mean, I, actually, I, I, out of all the rookies, this guy is actually the best. But... You think you think he's better than than Chekolod? Yeah, yeah, he's fucking okay. good. All yeah. right, well, we'll see. We'll see how how blue plays because I, I've I've only watched a small subset of games, so I'm not gonna say that I have the same knowledge of them as players as I do of as uh, Fabian and Nemesis. But I was ne I was never impressed the same way that like I feel like Nemesis got got super fucked by being on a top team because he was the weakest player on Fnatic. It's suddenly like oh now you don't deserve to be on any team. Like I kept on saying I think that Nemesis didn't deserve to be on a top two team, but him being on a four or five team like. I mean, no offense to you, but if I had the choice between uh, Nemesis and Abadage and I, I was the GM and I don't know either of these players personally, I would take oh, Nemesis. Oh, you take Nemesis, of course. Yeah. Yep. What? <laughs> Even though I know, I know the point Dom's it's trying to make 100%. there, okay. which, which is 100%. basically this guy is better than what his reputation is now. My problem is this, though. Even though I agree with that premise, like I always said he should have been on a Chalker or an XL type team mm -hmm. and then he would have been fine. My problem is this. I'm not going to weep one tear for someone like, oh, boo hoo. Oh, you got to be a mid laner in EU and get reckless as you made he Hiller sang as you support and fucking like get the best jungler in the entire West for a whole year. Oh, and you couldn't handle it. Oh, that must hurt so much. Get the fuck out of the game. This is a fucking professional game. We're here to be the best in the world. If I'm a top EU talent at mid lane, that's my dream setup. The only better team is the one that fucking Caps plays in, and I ain't Caps, so I'm not getting that shot. Like, I know what you mean. Like, I agree. It fucked his career, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is he didn't handle the media aspect very well. Like, if he'd have been smart with how he'd handle that, he could have sort of offset it and made it part of his persona that he's just like an edgy guy or whatever so he definitely fucked that up but i also do have like i have a hard time having sympathy for him because like i don't think uh, correct me if i'm wrong to this day he has never admitted any of it was his fault like he still doesn't even acknowledge he ever played bad by the way this guy's mental really like, actually, there's something okay. really wrong with this guy's brain mate i'm telling but it's anyway, i heard from people within his team that he used to just like not accept any of the blame for everything as well like the guy's ridiculous so when I hear that as well, that's some forgiven level shit there. Like, it doesn't matter how good you are at the game. If you're just an arsehole as a person, that gets boring eventually, mate. Like, that just gets yeah. boring. I mean, I, I, I can't comment on it because I don't know Nemesis, but uh, I, I would assume that that would be extreme, that, that he does probably accept blame for, for some things, but then there's this, there's very, like, distinct things that he, ha he like, has strong opinions of. And I think that that just goes to, like, who you are as a person and, and like, how you're, how you're brought up within this community, you know? Like, Nemesis is known as the guy that that is like really good friends with LS, like best friends with LS. So I, I assume that a lot of the 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 things that he won't push back on the I mean the thing that Bipple talked about the Renekton uh point about he just thinks the champion is useless all the time. Like there's oh gonna be there, there's gonna be things where he just has that so ingrained and it's gonna be tough to work with them. Um, they actually thought because it was a meme on LS stream that Renekton was a bad champ. Like is that actually real? Well, Bwipo said, right said that Nemesis thought that, that Renekton was a bad champ. Because LS champ. always said Renekton is a bad champ. They actually believe He just didn't it. like the way LPL used it, yeah. Well, he, he just thinks that, I like, mean, there's times where he thinks that there's just better picks. He doesn't, he doesn't think Renekton is bad. He just thinks that there's, like, always better picks almost. Think about that for a second, Gillius. Let me just put That's this in a frame so for you. Not true. Right, you ready? So I'm one of the best top players in Europe right now. I've been here for years. I've even been to World's Finals, World's Top 8 twice. I've even been in the Championship. I've won a few championships. I'm Whippo, right? Uh, my problem right now is not only does my mid laner suck, but he has a really big opinion about what champions I should be playing. It's like... Get the I fuck mean, out the door, yeah, man. What, what the fuck you? is this? Who is this guy? <laughs> Actually, I, I, I really dislike playing with people like this, by the way. I mean, I, I never played with Nemesis, but when someone tells me, like... Early game junglers are useless, useless man. Never play Rek'Sai, never play Lee Sin, never play Elise. Just, They're useless. Like, I, I just think in a professional setting, having, like, very strong opinions where you cannot even, like, change his mind on it is very bad. 
Like I, I agree with that. You, you you can have strong opinions and an open mind. Basically, like um, how do I say it? You don't always have to make a exp ex uh, Ausrufezeichen after every sentence. And an exclamation um, mark after every sentence. Exclamation yeah. mark. Mm -hmm. You can also what you want ask it in a question, right? Nemesis could say, mm -hmm. "Hey man." Uh, well, I mean, like, you just have to be open. So the way that I've always approached this <laughs> is you have to be open to trying it within a scrim setting. Like, hey, and not not half-assing it. Because what I hate that people do, and this is one of the problems I have with scrims too. Like, I'm sure you've experienced this. Where people, like, don't want to play with a pick. So they half-ass the scrim where you're trying to play, like, your, your, like, unique pick. And then because of that, the scrim goes to shit. And then it's like, oh, well, it didn't work out. Let's not play it. Yes, yes, yes. This is, yeah. This that is cancer. so many times. Soon. That, that is so really cancer. So it's so it's going to be so sad after this episode when Gilius has to write a twit longer apologizing for not disagreeing with everything we said on the whole episode. It's nah, a little I mean, meta joke there. Back, <laughs> okay, back come on, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even need to go there. I know, but, whatever. It's but, I mean, realistically, though, I think that that is just, like, a, a really bad mentality. So if you want to play Renekton, like, you just have to be open to being like okay so we want to try early picking renekton and this is how we're going to use it we're going to play a renekton with like nidalee at least some type of jungler that can potentially uh abuse the renekton setup we're going to play around top lane try to snowball through that and we're going to see how it goes and like if you're open to at least trying it and having your opinion changed it's great if you're one of these people that like sabotages the scrim block that's what i would call it i would call it sabotaging the scrim blocks by by not wanting to um you know give your all in a situation that you don't think is optimal yeah i can't fuck with that but i mean i have no no uh I have no idea if Nemesis did that. I'm just saying in general, like that is something that I've experienced that I absolutely I just, I, just, hate. I, I find it so crazy that Wipu comes on shows and just fires, you know? Like, he pops he off. To, he used to, Gilly. I think we might have scared him straight on that one, man. I don't think he'll be doing that very much from now yeah, on. Maybe not that anymore, used to be his style. That was crazy. Like when he was on the show and talked about uh, also upset and stuff. Man, that was, I had popcorn ready. That shit was hilarious. The problem but, is this, yeah. Gilius. In many ways, he's like the old school Western players before about season eight when they could compete with the Asians. He would he was looking real good in Europe, but then he went head to head with T1 in Korea, got his ass spanked, and now he just changed his mind completely. So, you know, just classic, classic EU top player from back in the day. <laughs> it's obviously not from season nine or season 10, is he? Yeah. Just bent right over. I mean I think the difference in, 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 in Quippa wasn't necessarily that he's like honest on shows because we get Tom, you can you can get hot this. He did literally say on the episode, literally, that he is willing to take it up the arse for fifteen minutes if that's what it takes. Like he, essentially, he was telling, he was trying to communicate it to us the whole time. Was, you know what's you know, the funniest thing? He's guys. like, he's right above me. By the way, I'm in the same building as him, so I'm in the okay. Schalke office, and he lives in the uh, uh, and the windows open. Maybe you can hear me. It's hilarious. <laughs> in 10 minutes i'm coming outside let's meet <laughs> talk. holy fuck but uh yeah i mean it, it just it, i think the difference with bobo is that that he's willing to talk <laughs> so uh like so uh so strongly about like his team his current teammates um and that's what what people don't understand because when we talk to you i mean anytime we mention even former teammates dreams uh odo omni you speak with like some level of respect about them I think that people were really surprised that it's like, damn, Bubble, you got like the best jungler in uh in LEC on your team, and he's talking about replacing him so that he can potentially have a better mindset within the team. I think that the way he talks about his current teammates and potential uh teammates and former teammates is like too real for a lot of people, which hey, I don't I don't fucking hate that shit. You wanna drop bombs on our show, I'll take it. No, but that's that's the issue. It's also too real for him, which is what he actually eventually had to realize, which is if he wanted to be a guy where some people think oh, he's like a bit edgy it. or toxic, yeah, he could do it. Like he could get away with it. But his problem is he also wanted everyone to it's like him, which too. is like you can't have both of those, mate. If you want to tell the truth about people, some people are gonna dislike you. Like some fans of that 100%. player are just gonna think you're hating on for no reason or that you've broken the cord of the locker room, or whatever. So like my problem with that one is he just had to pick one way or the other. And his problem is he wanted to do both, or in this case, not do one one time and then be like that the rest of the time. It's like, you've got to be consistent. Pick which one you want to do. Yep. It was a tough spot to be in. I, I would yeah, have not was. known what to do either in this position. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel like the for for now, because it's so like PR heavy, most players just choose to, it's like, hey, I don't know what's going to come of this. I'm just going to take the easy way out, you know, and not, not talk about anything. I don't know. It's just different, man. Like, I feel like what happens yeah. is the more drama you, you've been through, and I, I feel like you, you've been like this too, like, the more you're willing to withstand, like, when when people start shitting on you at Chalka when, when you guys were 0 4, I mean, you just kept your head down, kept on grinding, and, you know, have the mentality that, like, these people don't really matter, and you just got to do your best. And if you do your best, then most likely good things will come. So. 
I, I appreciate the mindset uh, for sure. But I just a lot of people aren't really like built to have the, the internet hate mob. And I think that you know, if you do enough of speaking your mind, you're going to have that at some point. I that's, think every, every single sure. person in Reddit, like whoever sees this, if there's one person that always talks shit in social media or Reddit, it could be like if, if you slowly start actually supporting players and like not always shitting on them. And like if we like all this drama shit, if it like calms down a bit, um, people don't always have to find the neg negative stuff. If someone does something bad, you can also give the person advice or like, I, I don't like this bashing thing. I, I, I think some people deserve it sometimes when, when someone like karma exists, right? Yeah, if someone sure. does a bad thing or like fuck, screw, screwed over someone, then I think he deserves to get something back in return, right? Nothing yeah. bad. I'm just talking about, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. But um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I just think everyone should just um, try to be nicer, you know, overall in Reddit, social media. Uh, just if you like a player, don't fucking insult him um, <laughs> to get his attention. That's what people are doing. And the only th Oh, yeah, like, man. I see that all the time. I see it. You, hey, you know, he's talking to you motherfuckers in Twitch chat right now. Uh, if, if you say something nice. I actually notice the nice messages more when I'm in a good mood than the bad ones. Like, it's like, but yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah, makes sense. All right, you well, probably have I a mean... special notification set for them. Oh, there's another one in three years. Fucking hell, it's amazing. <laughs> What's that? That's not mom's sound. What is this? <laughs> he checks it out. Yeah, also, you do say all of that, and then in about fucking three months, you're going to be saying to someone like, Yankos, I slapped you 3 0 like 10 years ago, and now where we'll do it again, you are trash to me. Like, <laughs> is it? And he's like, but just say nice things to people on social media. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you know, I lost the fucking Brox, I lost my confidence for three months, spiraled into deep depression, went to yeah. Korea. I, got I, shit I, on I, I, I don't know who I am, you know. I have this, I have a bad side, but I think I have a good heart. And mm -hmm. I don't know. When I'm grateful, like right, if I would play League of Legends right now, I would fucking end, you know, like the way I'm talking right now. I need yeah. to be the fucking bulldog to play this game. I need to be, I need something to play for. I need, yeah. I need competition, you know, like if I need to hate my enemy and I want to, I want to beat him and humiliate him. And then after the game, I will be grateful, you know. And if I don't, I think also why my career has been so long is this fucking anger inside of me that... I want to fucking win finally, you know, yep. and that what that's what keeps me going. So, mm -hmm. dude, inside his head, it's just a permanent like new metal fucking like compilation mix from YouTube of like I'm so angry inside. I hate them all. I, I must destroy my enemies. Like, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> this guy's on some fucking CS yeah, frag movie some, shit. Some some shit. shit I mean, I'm, I'm exactly. fun with it though. Like, I mean, if, if that's you what go. you need to to perform your best, like, it's it's literally whatever. Like, I would be the I, I would be the same way. Like, I understand how valuable it, it exactly. is going into like LCS. Like, just actually wanting to shit on your opponent, whatever it takes to make you want to go and like absolutely fucking destroy whoever you're playing against at in a competition i think that that's completely fucking you know i, I, I love so it. Make it's a fucking it. lincoln park mashup with all the gilius clips in it oh. gang king level two this blue <laughs> buff is for real there we go that was really good actually was that was that off the top or you had you <laughs> had that like i, I, I freestyled it it's all okay we'll, we'll, take it. we'll take it we'll take it we'll take it i like it how do you feel about age in esports, Gilius? Do you, do you feel because I mean you made a tweet recently about you know you're gonna play until you're fucking th like you're gonna be thirty years old shitting on these kids. Do mm -hmm. you feel like like it has any effect? Because I feel like you know right now the narrative is like oh shit, well Yanko said twenty five, his fingers are falling off, he's got arthritis, like his brain's gonna fucking fall out of his head and he's gonna be like worthless in, in a year. What do you think about the, this narrative that like age is so important uh, within esports? I think Jankos turned too much on the money side. That's why his fingers are falling off. Jankos could <laughs> actually beat Kenyon probably if he would have the right mindset, but streaming is too much fucking fun for him. I'm, I'm, while, while Jankos is streaming 10 hours a day, I'm grinding 10 hours mindfully, not talking to Twitch yet. I'm yeah. grinding in my fucking chair and thinking about how I can fucking beat my enemies and how they can beat me and crafting all these plans, okay? Yep. Um, I believe if Jankos would use his off-seasons more wisely, 
than making money, which is completely fine. As a Polish guy earning the fucking euros on Twitch.tv, this guy is probably one of the richest people in Poland really in like strange. a few years. Yeah. <laughs> All good, you yeah. know. Okay. But that, that's fine with me, you know. Um, I think I was actually on a bad path in esports uh, with the age thing because I was becoming so fucking fat. Like, my stomach was at one point so fat and my chest was looking like tits, you know? And, <laughs> like, I was eating, like, so much KFC Come and on. McDonald's and <laughs> I was on a very... I was on a... <laughs> I was on a very... It's that guy, Bob, with the bitch tits at the beginning of Fight Club right now. This is disgusting. Where's this going? <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> so is there anything I just fucking asked you? What the hell? So two years ago, I was, like, so <laughs> fat and fed up okay. with myself. And the like, tits, I... yeah, we know about that. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> okay, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I looked myself I'm in the mirror and saw, and saw my bitch tits and my <laughs> belly. And I was like, this isn't going to last long. And <laughs> now that I... Wait, but I, I didn't get to my point yet. Sorry. Keep going. Um, so when I actually lost weight and now that I'm fit and mentally healthy, I feel like I found my balance. Watch a lot of fucking Bruce Lee videos also the last weeks. He's like, find your balance, you know, be water, yeah. my friend. Yeah. Uh, you have to find it. water when that fucking whatever it was. I think it was a bad pill or something that killed him. It wasn't a good. I think it was a bad yeah. pill that killed Bruce Lee, wasn't it? So whatever. He should have yeah. been more water, but fucking diluted it, shouldn't he? There you go, Bruce. Take your own advice, you little fucking arrogant cunt. Why you stop there? And fucking telling us all live our lives. A little, a little, like, let's let Gillius finish his point. I don't, I don't know. I'm just dying at the <laughs> setup for it. Holy fuck. And, and, but, but basically, Why is it's this like... Going? You have to find the, the balance between your mind and your body, okay? Yeah. I, I found the balance. I, I found my mind, okay, when I was in esports. I was like, okay, I'm pretty good at this. But my right. fucking body was suffering. My body was suffering from a quick diabetes. And then <laughs> when I actually fixed my body issues and I lost weight, I lost like fucking 10 to fucking even more kilos. I feel like I have so much energy. I'm sure. not waking up at fucking two in the afternoon anymore. I'm waking up at eight or nine in the morning. And I feel like I, I cannot get washed up like this. Cristiano Ronaldo, these motherfuckers are peaking at 30 and they're playing football. Yes. It's yeah. like physical stuff. I'm, I'm going to peak at 30, I think. I'm, yes. like, if I'm allowed to stay in this business till I'm 30, I really want to see how I will play. Because... <clears throat> There's not many players that actually got to that stage yet. Like, mm -hmm. we're still a so young industry, right? Yeah. Um, and there's, like, some streamers on Twitch. There's, like, one challenger guy. Like, he's, like, over 30 and, like, he's challenger and he's, like, smurfing. He looks super healthy. Wait, who is this? Like, what I found out is life is not about age. It's about how you treat your mind and your body. Like, a, a, a healthy mind and a healthy body is very important to mm -hmm. live long. And if, if I fuck my body so hard that I will die by the age of 60, then of course my career will end when I'm 26 or 27, you know? So mm -hmm. that's my whole point. Um, I, yeah. I respect the setup for it. I mean, it makes sense. I, I agree with the mind-body connection. I, I, I was a little bit lost when you came with the bitch tits and, and the belly Dude, being so bad. <laughs> Yeah, you bitch. I was just being honest. I was just being honest. Most people like, could just, most people would probably just brush over that and be like, yeah, I was like a, kind of unhealthy. Yeah. <laughs> like, but... way, if this was like a focus group, we'd all be pressing no, no, disagreeing strongly <laughs> on the bitch tits part. Then the part about Bruce Lee. Oh, interesting. Yeah, four out of five. I like that. Bruce oh. Lee's pretty good, yeah. All that. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I, I came back with the Bruce Lee for sure. Well, uh, uh, that's normally where we end up cutting it, unless there's any. Uh, thing else that you wanted to talk about on the show that we didn't actually get the chance to uh, normally we'll wrap it up here two hours and five minutes pretty good episode lots of laughs man you're a funny guy uh, respect a, a lot of what you said and, and i think you gave proper insight into uh the scene so if there's anything else that that you, that you wanted to discuss on the show i'm open to it if not we can just wrap it up here uh, i just wanted to say i was actually very nervous and scared of coming to the show okay because uh, i i thought you guys will just destroy me and Ask me questions that I cannot answer. Okay. But uh, I'm really happy right now. I think uh, you guys, like, I really like you guys' show. I always watch it. I was just imagining how can I, can I even handle this? We Whipper was sitting there, like, it was looking tough, you know? So mm -hmm. I'm really grateful that you guys were so nice to me. And I want to thank you guys for doing this. No problem, and I man. hope you guys make multiple episodes of this in the future. Like, people love it. So, yeah, yeah. we definitely All want right. to. And we appreciate it a lot. I mean, Obviously, we want to just get 
a good balance of entertainment and also uh, give some insight into the scene. And I'm happy we were able to find that on the show. So thank you for being here, Gilius. Uh, it was great. We got God Gilius himself. One of the funniest episodes we've had so far. Far, Thank you, Thorin, for being here as always. Uh, we'll be live tomorrow, Thorin versus me, in a Froggen debate. We're going to be talking about uh, Froggen's career. We have different opinions on how he should be um, talked about and his uh, how his career really shaped up. And we're just going to be discussing how uh, or why we think the, those things. So hopefully you guys watch that. We'll be live tomorrow at the same time. And thank you guys for being here. Peace, guys. Thank you.